Simple Magic Spiritual Development for the Practical Mind Chapter 1 Overview My name is Zachary Farmer. I am a composer and a practicing occultist. I do not consider myself to be the most knowledgeable person with regard to the occult, but even as a relative neophyte, I would consider myself modestly well informed on the subject. I am a perfectly normal person, no different from yourself. I do not possess the power to call forth Satan by means of some ancient blood pact, neither am I ensnared within the thrall of such a being who, unless he so chooses to reveal himself to me, I would consider entirely fictitious. I am a man in my twenties who eats Chinese takeout, brushes my teeth in the morning, goes to Walmart, and shouts about politics, who also happens to have an interest in these topics. What follows and what you can expect to find in this series is a comprehensive beginning guide to assist you in understanding what magic is and how to begin performing it. No more, no less. Let me say at the onset that my goal here is not to mislead, misinform, or to otherwise pretend to be something more knowledgeable by any measure than I am about the matters that I will be presenting. Everything contained in this series is a matter of my personal opinion and understanding of the subject matter. It will, however, be based upon and backed up by fact. You are more than welcome to disagree if, as such, you find this particular explanation of these topics is not desirable for you. I will not be even faintly offended. There are sure to be many other explanations of these ideas, and I am certain you are more than capable of finding another that better suits your taste. Any given opinion about these topics is just as good as the other, as nobody can claim to know with certainty how any of this works, only that it does work. With that out of the way, let me explain what I seek to accomplish with this series. This work is going to attract a select few people the kind of people who are deeply intrigued by the subject of occultism and desiring a comprehensive explanation of what it is and what it can actually do for them, but find themselves lost when searching the internet for understanding and reading the riddle-laden words of occultists who seek to, understandably, obscure the simple meaning of things from the untrained eye. This seems sensible, considering it is not far from the very definition of the word occult. This is done generally out of some concern for the average person, who may not fully understand what he or she is doing or what it implies, and therefore use these practices unceremoniously and solely for personal gain. While this was of great necessity for reasons you will come to understand, it is not of the utmost importance any longer, as history is slowly proving that obscuring the traditions, while easy in time past, is now borderline impossible given the advent of the internet. The result is a growing number of people who learn the basics of some chosen occult tradition and then use it mindlessly and do more damage than good, both to their own mind and spirit and to others also, as magic done even haphazardly, but with regularity, will yield its fruit in time, for both the intellectual and the psychopath. My aim is to give you something I didn't have, my own words a first-hand understanding and account of what magic is, how to do it, and what you should expect. I will not speak to any matters I do not consider myself to fully understand from first-hand experience. There are many rituals I have not yet done and much I have left to learn. But I will give you a grounded understanding of entry-level so-called high magic rituals designed for spiritual growth and time proven to work as well as a few pointers in terms of so-called low magic, or I suppose you could call it spell work, though I am not inclined to call it that. Being that these practices have been kept from the general public for the majority of history, it can be difficult to locate a comprehensive guide for their usage. The information can be quite scattered and difficult to understand. My goal is to bring many ideas and practices from a wide expanse of traditions and interpretations together in one place. Most of that work has already been done for me by the Golden Dawn. From there, I will cut the fat, so to speak, to leave an instruction manual written in plain language for the understanding and application of what I would consider the most important practices in magic. Let's face facts. 
Most of us who have an interest in magic in the modern era began with an interest in the fantastical Hollywood version, and as such, we have an emphasis on instant gratification and mostly got involved in it as a form of study because we wanted to get something. I cannot judge that pursuit, and I dare say neither can most people. In my experience, however, while you will find it is indeed possible to cause great changes in comparatively small windows of time, it is rare that you receive anything at all without due effort. If anything, magic does not defy the laws of physics. Rather, it works with those laws to great advantage. This means similar laws apply to magic as to mundane life. It is not often that you are freely given anything. It is not impossible, but altogether rare. In addition, it should be noted that manifestation of your desires, while greatly important, is not the primary focus of these videos, but it will account for roughly a third of the material. I, like most occult practitioners worth a damn, do not consider simply getting what you want to be the chief aim of magic, but I do consider it to be important and often overlooked by the holier-than-thou types of the community. To accomplish one's great work, their soul's purpose on this plane, acquiring those things which you have need of is unavoidable. I will show you what I consider to be by far the best methods I have attempted of acquiring what it is you want. I feel sure, however, that whatever your reasons are for listening to this material, you will, in time, without a doubt, find yourself craving spiritual development, as well as mere practical manifestation. It seems that anyone who devotes themselves to this path earnestly comes to that point eventually regardless of their initial motive or curiosities. The ones who do not tend to ruin themselves well enough on their own anyway, so the separating of the chaff from the wheat is done almost effortlessly for the teacher of these techniques regardless. What you can expect to find in these videos is a very simple starting list of practices to prove to yourself the reality and effectiveness of magic. I will teach effectively four things, an understanding of magic and some history regarding it, the technique to slowly strip yourself of all illusions of who you think yourself to be, as well as discover who you are, the development of your energetic or spiritual self and its sensory faculties, and a few methods of manifestation as well as enchantment. I will explain all of this primarily by referencing relatively few sources from the teachings of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, and Aleister Crowley's work expounding upon their work, the Kabbalion by the Three Initiates, the work of psychologist Carl Jung, and the work of Peter J. Carroll. All of the materials I reference can be found online for free, on YouTube or as PDFs. This is not an exhaustive list and some of it may not even be mentioned in any great detail, but I am certain they will be at least mentioned in passing, and as such, it may be good for you to familiarize yourself with these works prior to listening. It all comes down to comparatively few practices that should not be extraordinarily overwhelming to the listener compared to what they could expect if they were to attempt to plunge headfirst into the void of verbiage used by the magical community that would doubtless sound like the nonsensical ramblings of a madman at best and the gibberish babble of an incoherent child at worst. These practices are visualization, meditation, the correct performance of both the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram and the lesser invoking ritual of the pentagram, and the creation and charging of sigils. I will not be covering the middle pillar ritual as, in my experience, nearly identical results may be achieved through simple meditation upon the so-called chakra system. If any wish me to address this ritual at a later time, however, I will do so. That exception aside, I will be giving you the same information that you would have been given upon joining a Golden Dawn Lodge and been expected to practice daily for at least a year, as well as the most fundamental technique used in chaos magic. Please do not allow the melodramatic name to dissuade you, as it is really quite simple. The correct understanding and application of these basic skills is the foundation upon which all magic practice is based. Once these practices are understood and applied, 
the listener will have a firm foundation for all other more advanced rituals and practices they may wish to attempt. If you are seeking more advanced techniques and rituals, you'd be wise to search elsewhere for now. I may get to them eventually, but if I have not mentioned it here, it is because I have no authority on the matter, as I have not yet actually performed any other rituals, having spent the last year devoting myself to the basics every day. This comes with the exception of a ritual called the analysis of the keyword, which I have elected to omit for simplicity's sake. Incidentally, I will not be teaching tarot at this time. Divination, while obviously useful, is not my primary focus, so I cannot say I have spent much time developing the skill as of yet. I have my reasons for this, namely because it is my perception that those who take up tarot as their first magical practice run the risks of becoming fatalistic, and while it is very useful to know what energies are at play at any given time, Fate becomes more malleable from the moment you take up magic, and therefore does not have quite the same authority any longer. If I take it up more intently than I already have in the future, I will be sure to explain it in greater detail then, in an addition to this series. Without delving into the depth of what I am about to say further than necessary, and putting the cart before the horse so to speak, allow me to give a final disclaimer. The work of magic is, simply put, and without applying any superstitious or unscientific jargon to the statement, the work of creating a definite system whereby you may directly influence your mental world, thereby causing, at bare minimum, seemingly magical alterations to your physical and psychological circumstances. I trust you will consider the importance of what I just said, as well as the importance of what I chose not to say. I am not saying there is no spiritual plane, far from it, But to the cynic, I am saying that regardless of whether or not you believe in spirit or any such thing, magic works for reasons we have never been able to fully identify, and it can be dangerous. It is both an art and a science, as its results can be replicated, and you are warned now that foolish usage of this information will likely cause problems, perhaps inconveniences, perhaps something more extreme. There is no need to believe in any god or be part of any religious organization to reap the benefits of magic. However, while it is not terribly dangerous to use the practices that I have listed here, the misuse of those same practices can result in imbalances in your psyche. I will therefore accept no responsibility for reckless abandon resulting in your admittance to your nearest psych ward. It would likely be a very short stay, and your issues would likely be reasonably easy to rectify, particularly in the early stages. But do not push your luck. That having been said, I am admittedly excited to be sharing this with you all. And if you've found your way to this video, and watched it until now, then I imagine you are well enough prepared for what to expect, and if your attention span is such that you haven't become deathly bored listening to all of this, then you have the level of interest and enthusiasm I would say it takes to make a good practitioner. If you are just here to listen with no intention of actually performing magic, but want to learn out of a genuine interest in the subject matter, well then color me flattered, and welcome. The more the merrier. I am not a genius in terms of magic, and I have only practiced it for a solid year, with my interest in the subject having been for about three years now, so I think you'll find me more than approachable. An old Baptist saying goes like this, A pastor is one sinner preaching to a bunch of other sinners. Similarly, I am one self-initiated neophyte, helping others to initiate themselves as neophytes without the necessity of a lodge and the pretensions commonly associated with one, particularly useful to fellow shut-ins. Undoubtedly, there will be those more advanced in study who feel I have no right to speak on these matters, and to them I say, screw off, it's 2020. I studied many of these practices for years before attempting them, and learned everything I could before embarking out of genuine fear of doing something wrong. So if I am not more advanced, it is due to literal years of preparation. I think that fact alone will help me to set many minds at ease. People who either don't know where to start or, like me, were simply afraid of causing some terrible, irrevocable change due to taboo and other foolishness, 
should find this refreshing, because having grown up in Christianity, I was quite afraid of it all myself until I tried it, and now I am here to tell you, not only does it work, but it's just a hell of a lot of fun. This concludes Chapter 1. Chapter 2. What is magic? Before you ever first lay hands on any magical equipment, draw circles of salt, summon Samael, cover yourself in chicken blood, of course I am joking, or thunder forth Hebrew you barely understand from your apartment to worry your neighbors, you will need to first firmly grasp what magic is. This is easier said than done, however, as magic is difficult to define. Compounding this is the fact that before you can perform a ritual, you must comprehend a small list of terms and a slightly larger list of correspondences, which must be well understood for optimal effect. To that end, this episode will be all about getting everyone on the same page, as much as such as possible, about what magic is and what it does exactly as well as a bit of peripheral history for context. To begin, as I have already stated, magic does not require a belief in a spirit realm. I would consider that it certainly helps, but it is not altogether necessary. I have seen many forums online of people who either were staunch atheists who, having performed magic successfully, were convinced of the reality of spiritual forces, or people who, having accomplished the same, remain staunch atheists, and consider the effects of magic to be purely psychological. Regardless of your belief in a spirit realm, or lack thereof, magic has something for you, as any psychological change is sure to beget a tangible change. Just as a single sperm cell grows into an adult human being in time, so too is your psychological integrity and thought process greatly responsible for your overall results and achievements in life. To quote those who peddle the power of positive thinking, a great life begins with great thoughts. To quote everyone's favorite cryptid, and a much more powerful magician indeed, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And last but not least, to quote the Buddha, a man is what he thinks of all day long. We know, without much contest, by the works of Carl Gustav Jung, that what we will be referring to as magic begins on a psychological level. It there extends to both the transmundane as well as to the mundane over time. Suffice it to say, magic could be referred to as an archaic form of psychology. Where it differs from the field of psychology is in its intent. Psychology, as a subject of study, seeks to passively observe trends in the psyche of individuals to determine exact causes for psychological disturbances and the physical consequences they ultimately yield. While I am sure all students of psychology have within them some capability of performing therapy upon others, unless the student intends on becoming a therapist, psychology is primarily a field of study and may take a more passive approach to the mind. Magic, however, takes a more active approach and could be considered the original source of therapy. It is an ancient method of directly altering one's own psyche to best suit his or her needs. It can feasibly be seen as far more than that, but for practical purposes, this is all it need be understood as. Magic is the science and art that provokes change in conformity with will. All intentional acts are magical acts. Alistair Crowley Now what I have just given you is the most cliché and yet, still to date, most effective definition I believe we have for magic, and not because it is imperfect, but because I feel that statement can be somewhat confusing early on. I will, like the grey beards of Skyrim, let you tap into my understanding of the word. I do not wish to imply that Crowley's definition was not thorough or exact. Rather, I hold it in the highest regard, and I feel it is perhaps even more inclusive than what I am about to say. However, I do believe that early practitioners will benefit from a slightly more specific explanation so that they aren't apt to be foolish as they are willful. To be perfectly scientific, and yet not delve into my own biases, 
I would define magic as being the formulation of a set of symbols whereby you may directly influence the subconscious mind and bring about changes as you so choose that will result in your rapid and seemingly effortless achievement of your personal goals. If you have ever seen the Adam Sandler movie Click, imagine being on autopilot to exactly what you want, but without that feeling as if you've skipped ahead and lost precious time. That is what magic can do. Magic gets you where you want to be in life by the most efficient route available. There will not be the wave of a wand and poof, you have what you wanted. You will not likely get to shout Wingardium Leviosa and go floating about town, and you will not call down a pillar of fire upon the heads of your enemies. I would not dare say these things are impossible, only that they are, in my humble opinion, ridiculous. But if you want to rid yourself of any illusions you have concerning who you are, what you're worth, and what you can accomplish, or if you want to watch others sit by scratching their heads in confusion as the earth beneath you seemingly caves at your feet as you march uphill, then magic is yours by right of birth to try your hand at. So now that we know how it does not work, allow me to explain how it does. The way in which magic works is by optimizing your mind for best advantage to a predetermined end. It alters your circumstances by first altering your mental landscape, or, if you will, your aura. Magic brings forth a change in your life through the path of least resistance by way of your own doing. The spirits, angels, demons, extraterrestrial or interdimensional entities or even whichever emotionally inclined god you've chosen to worship, will not bend down and grant you anything free of charge. Almost anything you desire to see occur can, with persistence, be made manifest, but not without you doing your fair share of the heavy lifting. This is why I have earlier stated that magic works with the laws of physics rather than against them. In terms of practical magic, which is to say, magic geared towards getting something that you want, consider the movement of water. It finds its way from stream to lake to river to ocean, and it does so by the path of least resistance and seemingly without strain. Similarly, the effects of magic can be compared to opening a stream of energy, which carries you without unnecessary obstacle to your goal, a fixed location in space-time. The specific method I tend to use most often for this is sigil magic, which I will explain later in great detail. Now that practical magic has been explained, let's cover ritual or ceremonial magic. The kind of ritual magic I will be explaining are the fundamental rituals used by the Golden Dawn. These rituals focus on building the astral body, or the body of light, with an emphasis on bringing about changes in your psychology and personality. The performance of these rituals is meant to make you aware of, and cause you to begin to feel sensations within, your astral body. That sounds awfully complicated, so let's make it a bit more grounded for those who do not favor the spiritual lingo. The rituals cause you to become much more vivid in your imaginative world, to the degree that you can convincingly visualize a scene with such detail that you may momentarily withhold disbelief in its reality. These capabilities, both to visualize a scene with all of the tones of reality and to become completely enveloped in it, are crucial skills that will net you much gain in all areas of magic. I encourage you develop them well. In the context of a banishing ritual, for instance, you will be imagining quite a lot of scenery and entities interacting with you. With practice, this imaginative act will feel as real as the ritual space and the entities will take on recognizable patterns of behavior and personality. This presumption, however brief, of the total reality of the scene you are envisioning is what causes the magical shift. Seeking to banish outside forces and balance your energy, thereby grounding you in the truest expression of yourself, is of almost no effect without the ability to clearly visualize it happening. You will find this true in many areas of magic and it is the essence of faith. A good way to contextualize this concept is to imagine that you are watching two videos play simultaneously beside one another. One of these videos shows a diagram, or even better, a medical scan of the brain. 
The other shows the actions of a ritual being performed. Imagine that with every movement or symbol seen, and every sound heard in the video of the ritual performance, a corresponding alteration is occurring in the brain on the brain scan. This is not to oversimplify the concept of the mind, and to imply that it is limited to the brain. The brain is no more the mind than the fingernail, and yet both the brain and the fingernails are the mind. I use the brain as a symbol because the word mind generally conjures an image of the brain anyway for most people in the modern era. I present it this way for convenience sake. The point is, ceremonial magic causes definite changes in the mind, which produce, in time, tangible changes in the world around you, and does so as efficiently as possible and in such a way where even your apparent setbacks often serve only to hasten the achievement of your goal in the long run. Now that we have that covered, I want to quickly address an oddity that you may well have noticed. The reason that we spell magic with the added K as opposed to the common spelling is to differentiate ceremonial magic from stage magic or magic done for entertainment. This was one of the many additions to the community made by Aleister Crowley. It best ensures that people are on the same page about the subject they are referring to. Imagine the surprise a man who is accustomed to pulling rabbits out of hats and performing card tricks for a living may feel upon being invited to a magic gathering, only to find himself surrounded by people chanting in strange languages and drawing in the air. He may well be deeply disturbed by the sight, having no context for what he has witnessed. It is to avoid these kinds of misunderstandings that we add the K. The History of Modern Occultism to qualify the validity of my earlier statement regarding the antiquity of magic, I will give you a bit of a quick, beeline rundown about how we ended up with the practices we use in the modern era. It is worth noting that I am only going to be referring to the direct spread of the traditions I will be teaching, as the history of occultism in its entirety is quite an extensive and uncertain subject. Before I go into that, however, let me take a moment to interject a single opinion. Magic, as I've said, belongs to everyone. No individual person or nation has any right whatsoever to claim divine right above any other to use these practices. Nearly every culture on earth has, inherent to its history, some form of occult tradition. What's more is that all of these traditions began during roughly the same time period. The high strangeness of that is a mystery for the History Channel, so don't worry. I will not be following that statement with... Could it be as ancient astronaut theorists believe? The debate over whose bloodline is special and who is capable of performing psychic feats far above the average slob is a debate that has raged since at least the beginning of recorded history, and one I will not engage in. Feel free to hash it out in the comments. I am sure the Hebrew people may claim that even before the drawing of the diagram of the Tree of Life, some form of Kabbalah was the first occult wisdom passed down from God to, I don't know, Abraham, Adam, Enoch, Moses, or some such. It would come as no surprise to hear that the Anglo-Saxon inclined may consider that the only people who we have to thank for our modern understanding of the occult are Aleister Crowley, Edward Kelly, and John Dee or perhaps the ancient Irish, Scottish, or Scandinavian mystics. Of course, they all share commonality in being white. Likewise, I would not find myself remotely taken aback to hear from an occultist of more Afrocentric assumptions claiming that it all dates back to Egypt. This is something they and Crowley may find some common ground on, despite being unable to reach an agreement upon the color of the skin of the people who inhabited that location. This would all be well and good were it not for the now-established fact that the Sumerians existed even before Egypt and had their own occult understanding as evident by the tablets which have been recovered thus far. My point is that it is not unusual to see someone claim the right to rule the world by possession of mental capabilities far beyond average which were passed down to them through some extraordinary bloodline, as if they were not required to prove themselves by attainment but could rather stand on the efficacy of their very DNA alone. I assure you, if any single person on Earth were to trace their family lines back far enough, each and every one would find themselves related, however distant, to some king, prince, president, czar, kaiser, or pharaoh. More to the point, if you were somehow able to follow that same line back far enough, 
I imagine we would all find ourselves linked by some common ancestor. So there you have it. God enfiefed the entire planet Earth unto Adam to rule over, and by the standing rule of enfiefment, each and every living soul may, by claiming lineage through the line of Adam, claim by right power over all the Earth. Happy moving on. So, where to begin? Well, the history of Western esotericism is essentially a history of those studies, partly religious and partly scientific, which came to be rejected by both parties in the context of mainstream teaching. To make it simple, the occult studies are too scientific for organized religion to condone and too spiritual for science to adopt as factual. As such, you may well find the path of the solitary practitioner to be a lonely one. Western esotericism, like most things on this planet, is rooted in Eastern philosophy, as its most fundamental principles emerged first around the Mediterranean and the Fertile Crescent. Practically the earliest concept of what we now call magic was the philosophy of Hermeticism, out of which came the later practice of alchemy. The observance of the Hermetic principles, of which there are seven, was perhaps the first practice which could be referred to as magic. It pertains to terribly oversimplify, to the observance of natural laws, and the ability of applying more complex laws against more fundamental laws. An easy explanation of Hermeticism is to define it as understanding how things work, the interplay between these processes, how to reverse these processes when possible, and how to apply natural law against natural law. These practices spurred a great deal of ideas which have since been incorporated into most religions, particularly the monotheistic ones. Though many ideas influenced the development of Hermeticism, for many years it remained the primary source of occult knowledge. Adjacent to this practice ran the mysticism of Europe, until at last the two crossed paths and ultimately merged somewhere around the Renaissance period. It was around this time that intellectual Christians of the era began to search for commonalities among the various faiths of the time, and, upon finding these commonalities, they began to merge pagan ideas with the Jewish study of Kabbalah, as well as modern Christian philosophy, or depending upon how you see it, mythology, to create a new esoteric movement. This movement was devoted to studying the science of spiritual things, which is to say, the elements of spiritual teachings which may be tested experimentally and verified by having the results replicated. This time period gave rise to many great occult practitioners and was, at least in part, the setting for the rise of John Dee and Edward Kelly, whose work with the Enochian language, the language of angels, remains to be of great relevance. The death of John Dee almost overlaps with the 17th century compilation of works that resulted in the book entitled The Lesser Key of Solomon, a grimoire of instructions for conjuration and communication with angelic or demonic forces. The late 17th century gave rise to the so-called initiatory societies, otherwise referred to in modern conversation as secret societies. These include the Rosicrucians, Rosy Cross Christians, and the Freemasons, who, due to rampant conspiracy theories, I trust require no introduction. These societies were akin to colleges of esoteric thought that one may only attend after having been recommended by word of mouth by an existing member. This process was called initiation. The 18th century served to extend these initiatory societies. A great many lodges were opened in local areas during this time to advance the philosophical ideas of these societies. This time period also saw the rise of several new branches of esoteric thought, which leads us to the 19th century. The 1800s to the very beginning of the 1900s serves as the point where all of these many practices began to converge into a single set of fundamental rituals. This is when the various philosophies of the many different branches of esoteric thought had become intermingled and widespread to the degree that they were now simply referred to under the title of occultism. This era also saw a return to pagan roots and a reinvigoration of those ideas. This modernization of paganism gave rise to the study of what we now know to be Wicca. Much has been made of the study of Wicca and the adjacent study of witchcraft. What we are most interested in, however, is the foundation of the society known as the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. If ceremonial magic is your thing, 
The Golden Dawn is certainly the most direct path I can think of to understanding its mysteries. The Golden Dawn was founded by three individuals, some debate upon the existence of a fourth. These founders were William Robert Woodman, William Wynne Westcott, and Samuel Lydell Mathers, and each of them were former Freemasons. As such, they borrowed quite a good deal from Freemasonry. This is not to say that the subject matter is identical, but that the setup of the Lodge and the progression through its ranks is similar to the hierarchical structure of the Masons, and with that undoubtedly came the process of initiation. There are three orders or circles of the Golden Dawn, and technically only the first order is titled as such. The entirety of the three orders is commonly referred to as the Golden Dawn, however, for convenience. The first order, the Golden Dawn, taught all of the material you will learn here and then some, with the exception of sigil magic. It was customary for initiates to learn the esoteric teachings of Hermeticism and apply these principles to the study of Kabbalah. An emphasis was placed upon the student's personal development and spiritual growth. The initiate would be taught to become aware of and observe the four classical elements and the roles these elements play in their life. They would then be shown the application of the banishing and invoking rituals of these elements for the purpose of balancing the proportion of each within themselves. They would also be taught things such as astrology and a basic understanding of the zodiacal forces, which, paired with an understanding of the elements, provided the groundwork for an understanding of divination. The most commonly used tarot deck to this day was originated by the Golden Dawn. The second order, referred to as the Ruby Rose and the Golden Cross, taught greater magic including ideas passed down from D, such as scrying and astral projection. And lastly, the inner circle of the third order was comprised of the so-called secret chiefs, whose existence seemingly nobody can agree upon. This society drew in many different enthusiastic intellectuals and was the converging point for many different occult ideas. It spread these concepts far and wide, and according to Israel Regardi, who we will cover later, the order had even made its way to the United States before the 20th century and its subsequent fall from popularity in the 1930s. During its time, the Golden Dawn created one of the most comprehensive compilations of occult tradition ever made. The Golden Dawn, however, being a secret society, was not interested in sharing its secrets with outsiders, and indeed, upon the disbanding of the order, there was even allegedly talk of destroying certain materials documenting these practices. Enter Alistair Crowley. Crowley, already obsessed with matters of spirit and the esoteric, and considering it his mission to bring East Asian spiritual practices to the West, joined the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn in 1898. He quickly befriended McGregor Mathers and was trained in the art of ceremonial magic. Crowley where to start? The man was every bit as much a comedian as he was a genius. He was a poet, author, artist, and a notorious mountain climber, as well as perhaps the world's most infamous ceremonial magician. He once remarked that he felt he had never found a satisfactory outlet for his many talents, but it was he that brought magic to all. Our very ability to discuss these topics hinges upon his having conveyed them to the public, a choice which the Golden Dawn would have certainly looked upon in disapproval. Crowley, however, was no stranger to disapproval. I would even go so far as to say he relished it. It is my suspicion that Alistair Crowley was the kind of man who, upon having been accused of some malicious, debaucherous, or otherwise morally reprehensible thing, would not so much seek to lie to cover up his involvement as he would lie to exacerbate the fear of it. He loved nothing more than to appear evil, and wore the accusations against him as a badge of honor. His mother referred to him as the Beast, and he adopted that title as his own with relation to the Antichrist of Revelation. A man whose ego was unmatched, he gave himself many titles. The Prophet of the Aeon of Horus, the Master Therion, and of course, the Great Beast 666. The man may as well have had the titles of a Targaryen from Game of Thrones. He referred to many of his wives at one time or other as the Scarlet Woman, a title he coined in reference to the Whore of Babylon. He was referred to as, and I quote, the wickedest man in the world, and I have no doubt he considered it the highest form of flattery.
He experimented with a great sum of unusual practices that, to our knowledge, had not been documented prior, or possibly even attempted, and he attempted even the most taboo of techniques. He had, for instance, quite the fondness for incorporating sexual encounters into his rituals. He would even involve tantric sex to the point of complete exhaustion, to assume a moment of gnosis he felt could not be attained by any other means, calling it erotocomatose lucidity. I think we of the modern era would call it post-nut clarity. Needless to say, I will not be teaching anything about this sort of thing. Feel free to experiment with it on your own. Despite his reputation, Crowley did what nobody prior to him had dared to do. He made magic a matter of public study. He did not make it easy to understand, writing at times in a cryptic manner which employed figurative language and other poetic techniques, and referencing so many concepts simultaneously that some of his work could be compared to Finnegan's Wake. Finnegan's Wake has been referred to as a book written in the language of the subconscious, and I think that is also a fitting way of describing some of Crowley's work. When it comes to the fundamentals, however, his explanations were reasonably, or at least comparatively, straightforward. Crowley took what he learned from the Golden Dawn and created his own system of magic, which he refined into the religion known as Thelema. He later created his own society devoted to the study of Thelema, known as the Ordo Templi Orientis. Thelema, or Thelema, which was named after the Greek word for will, focused with great intent upon the cultivation of one's true will. The religion had an almost ridiculous number of holy books, each penned by Crowley himself, the teachings of which served to democratize magic more than anything prior. By no coincidence, the primary rituals of the Golden Dawn were present, and with the exception of minor changes to suit his aesthetic, almost perfectly intact within Crowley's introduction to magic. Two of the best and most direct books I've seen of his are Magic in Theory and Practice and Magic Without Tears. At last we come to Israel Rigardi. Rigardi was an Englishman, but he lived in the United States. He was also an Orthodox Jew until he slowly became dissatisfied with the religion, and, upon reading the works of Aleister Crowley, he became increasingly interested in occultism. Having contacted Crowley, Israel was invited to move from his home in Washington, D.C. to serve as Crowley's secretary in Paris. He served as Crowley's secretary for several years beginning in 1928 and even remained by his side through a move back to England. Somewhere in the early 1930s, Rigardi and Crowley ceased to share a correspondence. Having learned much from the man, it was during this time that Rigardi began writing several books on the subject of Kabbalah. In 1934, he joined Stella Matutina, or Morning Star, in French, a magic society whose teachings were directly taken from, you guessed it, the Golden Dawn. He learned their rituals and rites for several years, while also studying the works of Carl Jung, which gave him some basis for linking his understanding of magic to the field of psychology. In 1937, concerned that Stella Matutina would soon follow in the footsteps of its predecessor, and that its rituals would be forever lost, he left the society and returned to the United States. In 1938, and for several years after, he, much like Crowley, broke his vow of secrecy and published a series of books which unleashed upon the world the rituals of Stella Matutina, and thereby revived in full the tradition of the Golden Dawn. This, needless to say, infuriated his fellow occultists, possibly even worse than Crowley's departure. The rest, as they say, is history. Occult teachings began somewhere in the region of the Fertile Crescent in antiquity and made their way through time and space, gaining more and more knowledge and structure as they spread. They then spread through Europe during the Renaissance and Victorian eras and ultimately into North America, where they fell dormant for roughly 20 years or so until they exploded in popularity in the 1960s. In most recent years, probably beginning somewhere around the 80s, but don't quote me, we have seen the rise of the New Age movement, a combination of something from nearly every occult tradition mashed into one. New Age philosophy combines aspects of occultism with the teachings of positive thinking touted by many motivational speakers 
as well as Buddhist, Hindu, and Christian teachings, with a side order of peripheral speculation surrounding numerology and even quantum mechanics. While I would not classify myself as a follower of it, I have nothing bad to say about the New Age movement. It can be too much of a free-for-all for some. This ensures, however, that it has something for everyone. And I have heard many interesting theories come out of people I would categorize as New Agers. Whew. That was a lot. But I assure you that everything I am saying is to make things easier to understand later on, when we get into the real nitty-gritty. Magic requires quite a lot of prerequisite understanding and preliminary information before you can do it successfully and have a clue what it is you are doing. I hope this helps to ease your burden. This concludes Chapter 2. Chapter 3. The Subconscious Mind From this point forward, I would ask that you please bear with me in my attempt to explain this. There are so many different understandings regarding the reasons that magic is effective, and no two are the same. Suffice it to say, I will have little choice but to disclose certain biases and opinions of mine as we move along. I will, however, be making an effort to explain things as objectively and scientifically as possible prior to disclosing those opinions. What I am about to explain is something which I imagine most people in the modern era have some understanding of already. It is perhaps not something that fellow practitioners would even put great emphasis upon, as many are not so concerned with how it works as the mere fact that it does. In my opinion, however, to give any remotely scientific explanation of the way in which magic works, this subject warrants explanation. That subject is the subconscious mind. What is it, how does it operate, and how does it differ from the conscious mind? These are the subjects this portion will seek to shed some light upon. Before I get into what the subconscious is and how it works, I should explain what the conscious mind is. The conscious mind is your focused attention. Your hearing or reading this information right now is a function of your conscious mind. The conscious mind is what is responsible for the learning of nearly any information. When you are intently observing or studying something, paying attention to a conversation, practicing an instrument, playing a difficult game, or otherwise intently focusing upon something, that is a testament to the function of your conscious mind. The conscious mind is responsible for your ability to logic and reason, and, to our knowledge, it is a reasonably new evolution overall across the expanse of living beings. The conscious mind is what gives you the capability of breaking down a complex subject into its component parts or concepts and understanding them categorically. Not to jump ahead, but a symbol commonly associated with the conscious mind is that of the sword or the dagger. This analogy is because the conscious mind operates much like a sword in its ability to slice concepts apart and discern their underlying components, to dissect things and to separate them. It is also relevant that Christ claimed that he came not to bring peace but a sword, that his word was sharper than any two-edged sword and could divide even the bone from the marrow. From one perspective, this is to symbolically say that his conscious mind was more developed than his peers and he could, therefore, reason more capably than others. This makes sense as he quoted, As my ways are above your ways, so are my thoughts above your thoughts. Thought is the function of the conscious mind. To give another biblical analogy, humanity is said to have been given the conscious mind upon Eve's choice to bite the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is because from that moment onward, there was separation and disparity. Good and evil, hot and cold, up and down, left and right. From this moment in the biblical canon, there is a newfound understanding of opposites and the ability of categorizing concepts into one of two or more separate camps, so to speak. The conscious mind is also the seat of the ego. It is for this reason that Eve is commonly depicted as having been tempted by the devil. I do not say this to imply the existence of anyone involved. It is only to metaphorically explain that with the conscious ability to discern one thing from another, came our ability to compare ourselves to our environment and others in our environment. 
The moment humanity became aware of its separateness from everything and everyone else around it was the birthplace of the ego. It both gave us the ability to control things and the desire to stamp out conflicting methods of control. It is necessary for me to dispel certain misconceptions about the meaning of the word ego. To have an ego does not merely refer to arrogance as one might assume. Rather, it refers to your entire concept of you. Everything you believe to be yourself, your body, your thoughts, your emotions, your passions, etc., are all the working of the ego. It is nearly impossible, without certain spiritual training, to be both aware and without ego. One implies the other. In order for you to be aware of your surroundings, you must be aware of yourself. To observe anything, there must be an observer. Without that separation, there is little to permit one to conceptualize, well, anything. Therefore, to be a thinking human being is to have an ego. While survival is the primary focus of the ego, it is not its only function. The ego is responsible for your concept of and perception of yourself, and who you think yourself to be. It will, however, often fight equally hard to preserve these notions as if they were just as important as your physical body. Animals do not, so far as we can tell, have ego, as they do not have conscious awareness save for some basic form. They have no concept of self, and therefore their feuds are more primal and based upon survival pressures, not upon their understanding of who they are or how things should be. Our consciousness begat our selfishness. The ego is not altogether evil. It is, in fact, necessary for life as we know it. It is, however, responsible for a great deal of conflict. I will not go too in-depth into ego right now, but I did want to make it clear that the conscious mind is primarily what is responsible for its existence. Now what then does it mean to have a subconscious mind, or as Jung called it, the unconscious mind? Unconscious means without consciousness. Subconscious means beneath consciousness. If consciousness is the realm of thought, then something which operates without or beneath the workings of the conscious mind is the realm of the subconscious, therefore a realm which requires no thought. You are breathing as you read or hear this, your heart goes on beating, your saliva glands are supplying a steady stream of moisture to your mouth, your hair and fingernails are growing, your blood circulates, and your cells are replicating and subsequently dying by the million every second. None of this requires your conscious attention. None of it requires thought. If the conscious mind is responsible for learning, the subconscious mind is responsible for storing that learned information. The information learned is stored in the subconscious mind as well as your very DNA. This much is evident by the existence of certain intuitive or instinctual processes. The way that cats go to their mother's nipple at birth the way that you would laugh and smile to imitate your mother as she did the same at you, or coo when your father rocked you, even the way you have some propensity for smoking, or perhaps an increased likelihood of having cancer or heart disease, is all based upon information stored in either the subconscious mind or the DNA. Some scientists would draw a hard line between information stored in the subconscious and information stored in the DNA. While I am not a scientist, the two differ little in my opinion, however, with the exception of how long a given impression has been made, and for the sake of this series will be explained as such. When you are learning to drive a car, it requires all of your conscious attention, and indeed can be quite difficult for some. Once you have learned the skill, however, that information is turned over to the storehouse, the subconscious mind. The subconscious then carries out that same task with little to no conscious effort. You soon find yourself driving one-handed, then eating a cheeseburger while you drive, or, and I do not recommend this, eating a cheeseburger with one hand, applying makeup with the other, and driving with your elbows. The subconscious mind is so capable of accepting a new pattern and performing that task without thought that you can become almost completely unconscious of doing a task that would otherwise require massive focused strain on the mind to do regularly without endangering others. The subconscious accepts a pattern that the conscious mind has given it, and given time, 
turns that pattern into a task which can be performed almost effortlessly and automatically. The conscious mind is akin to a computer programmer creating an algorithm. The subconscious is the artificial intelligence that carries out that encoded function again and again and again. Unlike the conscious mind, which can, in general, readily discern through logic the difference between the real and the imagined, the subconscious cannot tell the difference whatsoever between an objective fact and a perceived reality. For this reason, the subconscious is responsible for your dreams and the dream world, or the astral plane, if you will. Dreams are commonly thought to be recreations of patterns stored in the subconscious mind, be they people, places, symbols, or stories. The subconscious is responsible for recollecting each of the aforementioned patterns. An interesting practice, which can be made into a rather effective meditation, is to consider your breath at any given time. Now that I've mentioned it, you have undoubtedly become acutely aware of the process of breathing. Use this moment to focus intently on inhaling. Hold your breath for a moment, however long you feel comfortable. And then, release. Your ability to decide upon the intake and outtake of air means you are consciously aware of it. But what about moments ago? What about just before I drew your attention to it? It continues with the help of your subconscious mind. It was not until I told you to focus on it that you became conscious of its function. The conscious mind cannot focus on a great number of things, but it can focus on a single thing with great efficiency. The subconscious can focus on many things, but it does not have much ability to alter those functions. A good analogy is that of the eye. The eye can focus intently upon that which is right in front of it, but can only gather basic information from the periphery. Your peripheral vision can render only a blurred image of what lies outside of your central gaze, but it is more than capable of alerting you to unforeseen danger when big changes in shape or light take place. What the peripheral vision lacks in focus, it makes up for in general awareness. You likely learned to walk as a child. This process required every bit of your attention. It was far from easy or simple at the time, but by attempting to replicate what you saw adults doing around you, you slowly became capable of focusing your will and making it happen. With time, it became an unconscious act, requiring no thought. This same process applies for your learning to speak and write, your understanding of basic mathematics, and indeed many other processes which you likely consider trivial. The conscious mind repetitively engages in a given activity until the subconscious accepts this pattern and transforms that activity into a habit. This process can be applied to both healthy and unhealthy habits. A smoker who finds his or herself addicted to cigarettes was not always addicted. The repetition of the act of smoking, the image of themselves holding the cigarette, the emotional feeling associated with it, and the resulting chemical release in their brain and body was slowly transferred from a conscious choice to an unconscious habit. This goes for many, if not all, chemical addictions. The subconscious, as I have stated, cannot differentiate fact from fiction. This means that any time you are in a movie theater or listening to music and find yourself completely absorbed in the film or the song, your subconscious mind is susceptible to being imprinted. The same also applies to imaginary acts. So whenever you argue with someone in the shower, with nobody but the shampoo bottles to hear, you are actually implanting those ideas into your subconscious. This also has some relevance to Christian allegory, as Christ allegedly said that before you have murdered, committed adultery, lied, or stole, you are already guilty of that sin having only thought about it. This is because the subconscious transmutes the imaginary act into a tangible reality. You will see, however, as I continue to explain, how this can be used to your advantage. A primary function of the subconscious involves the attachment of emotions to symbols and patterns. Anything which causes you to feel strong emotion is something which parallels another, symbolically relevant thing in your subconscious mind. This is why the ancient Greeks referred to this part of the mind as the heart. This is not to say that they were referring to the blood-pumping organ but rather the literal meaning of the word, the core. 
They named it as such because the subconscious is what converts emotionally charged events into programming, and the area of the chest, where the heart is, is commonly associated with the feeling of emotions. For this reason, it would make good sense that Jesus would have said, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he in the New Testament, which was written in Greek. In fact, any reference to the heart, such as purify your hearts, ye double-minded, or even accepting Christ into one's heart, can be seen as a reference to the subconscious mind. The subconscious is imprinted most readily by either strong emotion or, as I have stated earlier, repetition. If, for instance, you fought and overcame a bully as a child, the resulting feeling of victory the image of the bully backing away, and the feeling of empowerment you felt as a result, is an emotionally charged event with a symbol attached. Similarly, if you lost a loved one, seeing their body at the viewing, feeling the sadness or any associated emotions has created some emotionally charged symbol in the subconscious. This means that any events which have similar parallels in your life are likely to generate similar emotions. In the same manner, any similar emotions felt are likely to call back certain images to the mind of the event. The interplay between the conscious and the subconscious is like a farmer's field, and the farmer who acts as a gatekeeper. Anything that is planted in this field will bear fruit in time. The trouble, however, is that this means weeds which have been planted will grow in just as great abundance as crops. As the saying goes, you reap what you sow. The subconscious is the field. It will give back anything planted in abundance, but it has no choice regarding what is planted. The conscious mind is the farmer or the gatekeeper. The farmer's job is to discern what is to be planted in the subconscious and what is to be thrown away. Whatever the farmer plants will yield an abundance, but he must plant wisely. Jesus makes this same point in his parable of the sower. By this point, you have undoubtedly discovered one of my biases. I should therefore clarify that I do not continue to reference Jesus Christ as if to assert the reality of the man. In fact, I lean decidedly towards presuming his non-existence. I reference his alleged words for two reasons. Firstly, to show that the ideas that I am teaching are by no means new and have been around for some time. Secondly, I use biblical examples often because having grown up in Christianity, it plays to my subconscious strengths. I do not seek to encourage anyone to join any form of religious organization and would actually strongly advise against it. Alas, do as thou wilt. Moving on. The subconscious does not often provide for memories which can be readily recalled. Rather, they are murky, hazy memories rooted, generally speaking, in childhood and often brought back by such things as images, sounds, and especially scents. The conscious mind, on the other hand, generally can recollect, however well or poorly detailed, depending upon the memory of the person in question, a wide array of events which have occurred in one's life whilst they were conscious. Obviously, this poses a problem. People can recall their infancy and early childhood to varying degrees, but most of us cannot recall a great many memories from that period in our development. This is because the conscious mind is not well developed in a person until around the age of seven. This means that from the ages of one to six, the individual operates mostly out of subconscious behavior with little conscious thought. The troubling thing is what this implies. For at least six years of your childhood, your gatekeeper was not tending the field. You were in a kind of hypnotic trance. Anything and everything, real or imagined, during those years went straight into your subconscious mind without any restraint from the conscious. This is, as any psychologist will tell you, the cause of a great many mental issues and complexes, as well as many advantageous predispositions towards life. When you were a child, you were told things and observed things about the way the world around you operates and your place in it and those ideas have become firmly rooted in your subconscious without your consent. The result, for better or worse, is that your adult mental health, emotional well-being, and assumptions about life are all rather strongly linked to your upbringing. Say, for example, that you grew up in a home without one of your parents because of a nasty divorce due to an unfaithful party. This can yield a subconscious assumption surrounding the apparent inefficiency of monogamy, 
or perhaps it yields cynicism with regard to morality and marital relationships. You may find yourself similarly having difficulty finding relationships in which you feel trusting of the other person, in adulthood. Or perhaps you yourself have a tendency to self-sabotage by cheating. Similarly, perhaps you grew up in an affluent home. You were always surrounded by nice things. This may have resulted in your subconscious assumption that people are generally materially well-off, and you may have found it effortless to acquire similar wealth in adulthood as a result. These subconscious messages can yield both good and bad fruit. It all depends upon the message. To ascertain what is in someone's heart, you need look no further than the results they get in life. By their fruits ye shall know them. So then, without getting too deep into this before I've explained the rest, a primary goal of magic is to turn over an intention to the subconscious mind. After all, if a given goal requires you to put forth massive effort for its attainment, would it not be tantamount to magic if you could turn that function over to the part of you that is responsible for the effortless maintenance of the many functions that keep you alive? How easily might you attain a goal if it had been accepted by the subconscious? Keep this idea in mind. Now that was quite a bit about the subconscious. This may all seem irrelevant now, but in the next chapter, we will get into a few more mystical concepts, and I will make it all make sense. And I think you will see how it all comes together quite nicely to create a grounded approach to magic. This concludes Chapter 3. Chapter 4. The Collective Unconscious and the Magical Mind Here is where we will delve into the more mystical side of things, as well as the single most opinionated assertion I will make. It will, however, still remain reasonably scientific, as it is primarily an explanation of certain psychological concepts. Do not worry. I am not seeking to convert you to the line of thinking I will present. I am only seeking to give you my understanding as a framework, a template, if you will. You will undoubtedly personalize to taste and discover what works for you on your own. But for the sake of the terminology I will be using, I am afraid I cannot avoid but give you my own interpretation. We all have our own rationale for why a practice as irrational as magic works. Firstly, we need to define the collective unconscious. Carl Jung coined this term to explain a phenomenon he noticed in which all human subconscious behavior is seemingly linked by a thread of underlying common patterns and symbols. He called these patterns the archetypes. Jung believed that in addition to the individual subconscious, there was an older, more primal kind of network of trends that were instinctual to all human beings' cognition, and that these trends of behavior have associated symbols and characters which embodied or personified them. He called this network the collective unconscious, and he believed that just as the subconscious is more primal and fundamental than the conscious, the collective unconscious is perhaps more primal and fundamental than the individual subconscious. The collective unconscious consists of many different characters with various traits, as well as many other things. These characters are called the archetypes. These characters are a sort of historical compendium of past human psychology which is embedded deep within our psyche. As such, they generally relate closely to common mythological symbols, the wise old man, the world mother, the hero, etc. He also believed that just as there is an archetype for every healthy psychological attitude, there are also egoic distortions of these archetypes. He referred to these distortions as shadows, and these shadows have a cumulative effect on a given person's psyche. That effect comprises what he called the individual's shadow. The shadow is the distortion in their psyche that results in their increased ego response. It is an image of the biblical fallen man after the events of the Garden of Eden. It is the part of every person that could be compared to the devil on their shoulder. Jung argued that the adequate approach towards healing one's shadow was not to attempt to ignore or suppress it, but rather to uncover how to incorporate it as a genuine part of yourself and use it to your own end. There are 11 different archetypes with 11 mirrored shadow distortions. This combines to yield 22 different personalities. 
The number 22 is of some relevance, as there are also 22 paths leading between the 10 Sephiroth on the Tree of Life in Kabbalah. Despite lacking one in number, the 11 archetypes can be compared to, if not overlaid with the 12 signs of the zodiac in astrology. Another example signifying these 12 character types can be seen in the 12 disciples or the 12 tribes of Israel. The above correlation is all speculation on my part, but the simple fact is, any of these methods of understanding the archetypes is nearly as good as the next. The point is, there are mythological symbolic characters which have definite personalities associated that are deeply entrenched in our subconscious mind even before birth as a result of our very species. Jung believed that there exists this collective set of psychological drives which our subconscious develops out of. From there we develop consciousness and slowly begin the process of individuation. Individuation, to Jung, was the natural process by which a child grows to become the person they are destined to become. He believed that the archetypes had much to do with this process, and that every individual was essentially becoming an embodiment of his or her most resonant archetype. He called this embodiment of the collective unconscious within an individual his or her persona. Persona is a word which references the mask worn in theater or plays. Therefore, persona has much to do with the aforementioned ego. An individual's persona is the mask he or she wears to participate in the social game, so to speak. The persona consists of all that you think yourself to be, and all those things which symbolically appeal to you as a representation of your individuality within the world. It is essentially the character you have built yourself to be, and it is generally a distillation of one or more resonant archetypes that appeal to you instinctually, logically, emotionally, or otherwise. Your persona is the resultant combination of both your true self and your suppressed shadow, and is, therefore, representative of usually several different archetypes. This combination of archetypes, however, still generally resonates with one greater than the others, and it is with this archetype that your character will be found most in common. In this sense, the world as we know it is not so different from a role-playing game. The Link Between and a bit about Hermeticism. Now how does all of this psychological stuff relate to magic? Well, this is where I will become somewhat controversial, as I will be giving you my humble opinion on the matter. To qualify what I am about to say, I know you are tired of hearing me say that, I'm going to refer to a few of the Hermetic principles, the earliest magical ideas. The ideas I will be explaining here were recorded in a book referred to as the Kabbalion, which was written in 1908 by anonymous authors under the pseudonym The Three Initiates. It is based upon the Corpus Hermeticum, which are a list of teachings attributed to Hermes Trismegistus, or Hermes the Thrice Greatest. It is unknown whether or not Hermes actually lived. Hermes, as a figure, however, was said to be the most powerful and intelligent Egyptian mystic and perhaps the founder of magic itself. He is closely associated with the Egyptian god Thoth, and his name is the basis for the Greek god Hermes. Both are gods of communication, writing, language, message delivery, and magic. As such, the two are often combined under the alias of Thoth Hermes. Mercury is commonly linked to Hermes in astrology, as it also corresponds with the aforementioned skill set. The Kabbalion listed seven principles considered to be laws of nature, which were said to have been discovered by and explained by Hermes Trismegistus. They are the basis for a great deal of magical work, and from the first law one can easily see why I say magic and psychology are inherently connected. The first principle is the law of mentalism. This is the assertion that everything you see is less an emanation from and more contained within the mind of God, which hermeticists simply referred to as the all. The idea posed is that just as we are mental beings, so is the entire universe a kind of mental organism, though it could not be called an organism. It may not be aware in the same way that we are aware, but it is aware nonetheless, and we are all part and parcel of it. This principle is not to say that you are God, it is to say that everything is God, and yet while everything that is should be considered one with God, God is not limited even to everything that is. Make sense? Let me elaborate. We are all one with the all. 
Indeed, everything that exists came from and is one with the All. Yet the All is far greater than all that we know to be. We come from and are ultimately assimilated back into the All. The All is a lot like Brainiac from Superman, if Brainiac wasn't evil and couldn't even be bothered to reside in a single body. The law of mentalism is, the All is mind, the universe is mental. In the same way that we think, the universe thinks, and we are in a constant communication with it. This segues us perfectly into the second law, the law of correspondence. You will have undoubtedly heard its maxim and likely seen it discarded as satanic. As above, so below. As below, so above. The meaning of this law pertains to the ideas of the microcosm and the macrocosm. Microcosm means small world, while macrocosm means big world. Another way of wording this principle would be, as in the macrocosm, so in the microcosm, or vice versa. Essentially, what is being said is that anything happening on a large scale affects how things operate on the small scale, and vice versa. A last law I will mention is the law of cause and effect. This law is not only a law in Hermeticism, but also a genuinely accepted rule in modern science. The maxim goes, every cause has its effect, every effect has its cause. Everything happens according to law. Chance is but a name for a law not recognized, and there are many planes of causation, but nothing escapes the law. This is to say that everything in life is a stream of causes and effects, which are the causes for future effects, and so on. Nothing happens by accident or sheer coincidence. There is always some cause. If modern science has not yet become capable of understanding the cause, it does not imply the non-existence of a cause, only that it is happening on a causal plane which we cannot yet observe. There are four other laws, but these three are all you will need to understand my points here. If you wish to hear more concerning Hermeticism, I would be happy to continue at another time. But for now, I would encourage you to read the Kabbalion, or listen to it on audiobook, as it will go a great distance toward helping you understand many magical concepts. Understanding these three concepts is, in my opinion, a perfect place to start with developing a magical mindset. Essentially, the reason I explained those three laws from the Kabbalion is to say this. Magic is a process of influencing the world by first influencing yourself. The subconscious mind acts as a kind of link between the conscious mind and the collective unconscious. Altering the subconscious serves to dramatically change the results you get in life by changing the habits that you perform without conscious attention. To go further, it is my belief that a powerful enough shift in the subconscious will impress upon even the collective unconscious. This will change not only your habits, but the habits of others towards you. If the universe is mental, and we are also mental, and we apply the law of correspondence to that, then what the universe thinks not only affects our thoughts, but the reverse is also true. Our thoughts must also affect the universe. Apply also the law of cause and effect, and it becomes clear to see how magic might happen. Magic is not as it has been depicted in Hollywood. Magic is a science which we have no method of studying directly as of yet, as it occurs on a causal plane we cannot observe. We do not know why it works, because we simply cannot observe it operating directly quite yet. We can, however, indirectly observe its effects, in the same way that you cannot see the wind, but you can see the leaves moving because of it. Magic is to construct an intention and send that thought to the thinking cosmos, which will cause, by unknown law, an effect. Generally speaking, the effect we are hoping for is for that intention to manifest in the physical world. Now that is unusual as all hell to most people's ears on its own, but I am here to tell you, it works. I've seen the most unusual things occur in perfect relation to my own thoughts. These synchronicities, as Jung called them, become more and more apparent the further you delve into these subjects, and I am not talking about a few numbers on a license plate. I am referring to, in extreme cases, entire shifts in world events, which seemingly line up with perfect timing to fulfill a desire of yours which has nothing at all to do with those events. As I've said, magic can be quite dangerous if handled without care. The Magic Maker Now, this is where I will bring this all together as well as express that rather opinionated theory of mine. 
My theory is simply this. The reason that the hermetic principle of mentalism works is because of the link between our subconscious minds and the collective unconscious. If information can be passed from the collective unconscious to the subconscious, and information can be passed from the conscious to the subconscious, then by the law of correspondence, the subconscious can be used as a middleman to pass information from our thoughts into the collective, in the same way that the opposite happens. This is how I believe magic occurs. I believe that in the same way that the collective unconscious affects the subconscious of every living person, so too does the subconscious of every living person affect the collective, and the two are inherently linked. It is in a constant feedback loop. Now, to get weird. I believe we are essentially a hive mind on an unconscious level. A hive mind is a group of organisms who act with a shared mind. I do not mean to say this in the literal term, which is to believe that we are directly sharing conscious thoughts through ESP or some such. Only that we share subconscious information through the collective unconscious. Consider how we might act if we had no concept of self. If humanity were without ego and conscious awareness, we may well behave no differently from birds migrating for winter, fish swimming in a school, or bees building a nest. Intuitively and instinctively sleepwalking through life in lockstep based on common subconscious programming. I believe the collective unconscious is this hive mind. I believe it not only houses our psychic imprint of the archetypes, but that it is also a kind of information highway between the minds of a given species that registers only on the unconscious level and contains information relating to the persona of every individual within the species. Now given that animals do not have egos, they do not have to worry about the passing of information regarding the persona. But we humans do. Consider the radio. Radio waves have always existed, but until we created a device which could receive those waves and a means of broadcasting sound through them, we never had a clue. The same goes for television waves. Likewise, the internet and the possibility of harnessing Wi-Fi has always been there, but we didn't always have computers to receive it or a means of making sense of the information contained within those frequencies to decode it. I believe that the collective unconscious is similar to the internet. It is a great reservoir of information which is passed from human to human on a constant basis on an unconscious level. We simply have no way of seeing how that information travels. Imagine if you could change your mental image and your subconscious presumptions about yourself in much the same way that you change your profile picture on Facebook or your avatar on Xbox Live. Now imagine that this alteration changed someone else's mental image of you without you doing a thing, thereby changing the way they treated you. Imagine that you suddenly perceived yourself to be a rich man. Now imagine that others suddenly felt the same about you, and they couldn't quite put their finger on why. This is the kind of thing commonly seen in magic, and I believe it has everything to do with this line of communication between the conscious, subconscious, and the great information highway of the collective unconscious. As we stated earlier, the universe is mental, and as above, so below, as below, so above. Every cause has its effect, and every effect its cause. It stands to reason, then, that any change you consciously make to your subconscious mind will result in a change in the collective cognition of you. We cannot see the wires that connect us, just as we cannot see Wi-Fi, but every individual is linked by this collective mind. Altering your subconscious mind powerfully enough will alter this collective mind, and that will alter the information that is fed back to the subconscious minds of everyone on Earth in an endless feedback loop. It will change the fundamental presumptions that everyone has about you, and everything about the circumstances which present themselves to you. This is why I believe magic works, and this is what I am going to teach you to do. This concludes Chapter 4. Chapter 5. The Absolute Basics This chapter will be dedicated to the very simplest techniques that you will require in order to perform magic of any kind. Both of these skills have massive parallel uses and carry over into many other fields, and therefore, their development will be advantageous to you in many aspects of life aside from just magic. These skills, as previously mentioned, 
are meditation and visualization. Visualization will perhaps be of greater importance in the long run, but in my experience, in order to adequately visualize without disturbance, the ability to put oneself in a meditative state is crucial. Meditation A meditative mind, simply put, is a clear mind, a mind void of distraction and not as easily carried off on a whim by the river of thought. The ability to meditate, and especially, though they are slightly different, entrance oneself, is a foundation for many magical pursuits. Meditation is defined in many terms nowadays, and no two will agree upon its exact function as a result. I will be giving you my understanding of the skill, but you are free to conceptualize it in any way which is most pleasing to you. What cannot be disputed is its usefulness to our cause. Every culture has a different way of meditating and their own goal for practicing it. They do not all agree upon what it is exactly, but there are commonalities which we can draw from to provide a comprehensive understanding of what, in general, you should be aiming to do. A common statement of meditation is that it is the act of shutting off the mind. This is not to say you go brain dead, but that your critical faculties and emotional responses are somewhat dulled. The goal can be defined as becoming one with the earth, entering the spirit realm, or any other desirable metaphysical definition. To keep matters as scientific as possible, I will define meditation as the process of closing down, to whatever degree one may, the function of their conscious mind. This is not to say that you will be able to achieve this necessarily in full, as the only time the conscious mind is completely inoperable is when you are in some form unconscious, as the word would suggest. This means you are in one way or another asleep. The goal of meditation is to diminish the conscious response and critical faculty. As I've said, the conscious mind acts as a gatekeeper for ideas which may enter the subconscious garden. Sometimes, however, we may have a goal which our critical faculty tells us is physically impossible for us to reach. Such assumptions are merely subconscious programming based upon past input. In such instances, in order to communicate a new pattern to the subconscious mind without our conscious mind, the voice inside your head, yapping on about how impossible it will be for us, we must disable the conscious mind to some degree. This is the basis of hypnosis and hypnotherapy, to shut down the conscious to either affect or discern what is within the subconscious. The ability to meditate means that you can, theoretically, open a line of communication to the subconscious at will. This is to be capable of, to put it simply, brainwashing yourself. There are innumerable methods of putting yourself in a meditative state. The most common, however, generally revolve around observing first your body, then your breath, followed at last by your thoughts and emotions. Your goal is to calm the response of your entire nervous system based upon each of these stimuli. A good method to start with is to either sit comfortably or lay down in a nice quiet place, anywhere that gives you a feeling of genuine serenity to start with. You may even perform a few stretches beforehand to loosen the body in preparation. Take a few deep breaths, in and out. Relax to the best of your ability. Be still and close your eyes. Our goal is to shut off as much stimuli from the external world as possible. Observe your feet. Avoid looking at them for now. Instead, mentally consider their location in space. Attempt to focus your attention upon them. You will likely feel a light tingling sensation, which indicates your focused awareness of any given body part. Consciously feel them becoming loose as the muscles release tension. Take a deep breath in, hold it for a moment, and then release. Next, move to the lower legs. Perform the same process. Focus your awareness upon them and let them grow heavy as if they are sinking into the ground or bed beneath you. Feel the muscles relax and the tension dissipate. Take several deep breaths in whatever manner you feel most comfortable. It is important, however, that you do not go to sleep during the process. Move on to your thighs doing the same, followed by the waist and then the stomach. Move up the trunk of your body, performing this process until you reach just beneath your collarbone, and then perform the same process with your hands as well as your arms. Finally, perform this same process with your neck and your head. 
By the time you will have finished this, it should have taken somewhere around 5 to 10 minutes or more to begin with. You should have completely relaxed your physical body. The body should feel calm. You may feel the need to fidget at first, but this will pass with time. At this time, you should turn your attention to your breath. Begin to focus on your breathing, in and out. Focus with all of your intention on the process of intaking breath and exhaling it. Occasionally, you may find it beneficial to hold it for just a few seconds prior to releasing. Everyone is different. During this process, thoughts will race through your mind. What will you eat this afternoon? The way your boss treats you and your co-workers. The plans you made a week ago to hang out with a friend this weekend. All the way up to the very meaning of life itself. Allow these thoughts to come and go. Do not entertain them in any depth, but do not attempt to fight them either. Think of the mind like a river of water. Thoughts flow in and they flow out. Similarly, every thought has some degree of emotional response. Think of these emotional responses in the same way. They are part of the river. The emotion comes riding on the thought and goes just as readily, passing through your system like water through a river. Whenever an intrusive thought comes, focus on your breathing again. If it is particularly pertinent, count to ten, taking a single deep breath in and out per each number counted. By the time you get to ten, the thought will have passed. Continue this process for as long as you like. Eventually, you will feel a euphoric, light, and floaty sensation, almost as if your consciousness is no longer confined to your body. If it helps that you think of it in exactly this way, then by all means do. Practice this daily and try to push yourself for longer periods of time with each meditation. Eventually, as you become familiar with it, you will find methods that are easier and quicker to get to this euphoric state. As this happens, the process will not only lose its complexity, it will become deeply relaxing. The feeling should be akin to being asleep while fully awake. Once you have become reliably capable of getting to this state, you can say without a doubt that you can meditate. Go brag to a few friends to sound like a spiritual guru. Of course I am joking. This state, however, is precisely what you want to become familiar with. As for however long this state lasts, your subconscious mind is open for communication. What I have just given you, however brief, is the essential process of many if not all meditative practices. Anything can be meditation so long as it puts you in this state. Next, we will cover visualization. Anyone listening who has delved into the depths of the philosophy known as the Law of Attraction will have some familiarity with these concepts. Visualization Unlike meditation, there is little dispute regarding what visualization is. As the name implies, it is the process of imagining a scene, and I would say that it is the most important ability in all of magic. The better you can visualize, the more endless your possibilities. Visualization is the process of creating a pattern, a blueprint, if you will, for the mind. If I ask you to imagine an apple, you undoubtedly can. You may even be capable of recalling the taste, the feel, and the smell of an apple. All of these play into visualization. To visualize is to use the third eye, so to speak. Though the third eye is not merely an organ of sight, it is capable of replicating, through imagination, nearly all sensory input. The more vividly you can imagine a scene, the more you can bring it to life with color, sound, texture, sense, and emotions the better you will be at magic. The goal of visualization is not merely to picture an image on the screen of the mind, but to fully immerse oneself in that scene as if it were currently happening. The purpose of this is because, as I have said, the subconscious cannot tell the difference between an imaginary act and physical reality. It considers all input which passes through the conscious gatekeeper, and it assumes all that it is given to be literal. The subconscious does not speak in figurative language. Anything symbolic has a literal meaning to the subconscious. Even fully conscious visualization has its uses, but in my experience, to visualize after having achieved a meditative state is far more beneficial. This is because the dropping of all conscious defenses and the clearing of distracting thoughts leaves the subconscious in a sponge-like state, ready to accept whatever information is given to it. 
A good method to use to practice visualization to start with is this. Go into meditation until you have achieved this trance-like state. From here, it is important that you do not fear failure or put too much emphasis on avoiding mistakes, as it will pull you out of the trance. It is good, therefore, to begin with visualizing something simple and harmless. Let's give your mind something easy to imagine which bears little weight. Imagine, as vividly as you can, the home you grew up in, provided, of course, that you have a few fond memories of the place. If you moved often, then imagine whichever place you can remember best, or whichever one you have the fondest, nostalgic memories of. Imagine the way it looked from the outside. See any trees or shrubbery. Picture the door and the windows. If it was common for the lawn to be mowed, maybe even consider the scent of freshly mowed grass. If not, try to feel the sensation of the tall grass brushing your ankles as if you were standing outside. If there was no lawn to speak of, imagine the pavement or whatever else surrounded the home. Imagine the street, the neighborhood, or cul-de-sac. If it was quiet, imagine little more than the sound of the wind. If it was a city or a louder location, hear those sounds which were commonplace there, be they cars, birds, or the like. Now, open the door. Go inside and imagine the entire layout. Walk around the home and see it just as it was, every nook and cranny. If there was anything particular or special to you in the home or surrounding it, recall that. Maybe you jumped on a bed with friends and dented a wall as a child, and that dent was never repaired. Put your hand on the dent and feel the groove of it. Perhaps you carved your name into a tree outside. Go find that tree. Smell the bark. Run your fingers across the carving and feel it just as you know it would have felt. Maybe your mother would occasionally wake you up with breakfast or bake. Imagine any associated scents, tastes, or joyful emotions. Be there and make the scene as real and alive as you are right now as you imagine it. Feel how the memories you have of this place affect your mood. If none of this resonates because you have few fond memories of your childhood, then imagine anything that brings fond memories and, in similar fashion, put yourself in the scene. Regardless of your approach, once you have found that fond memory, spend some time there. Play around in this dream world and give it all the tones of reality, and see how joyful you feel when you return to the world and open your eyes. This is the art of visualization, and, to use more magical terminology, it is how we explore the astral plane. Now in the same way that this works with the past, it also works with the future. Just as you can project yourself back to imagine a past event, you can project yourself forward to imagine a future event. The problem is, we spend all too much of our time recalling past events which did not go to our liking, and feeling the associated negative emotions, replaying these events in our minds. If not this, then we tend to become worriers, anxious of the future, and similarly imagining ourselves in all manner of horrible circumstance to which we attach an outpouring of negative emotion. The subconscious mind does not understand time, and perceives all events as happening right now. And as I've stated, it cannot tell the difference between what is real and what is imagined. So if it accepts patterns and their associated emotional responses, and then manifests these patterns into physical reality, how great a number are you doing on your poor unsuspecting mind by regularly imagining, be it past or future, negative circumstances and negative emotions? Every time that you visualize yourself in a situation from the past which played out poorly and brought with it negative emotion, or imagine yourself in a negative situation in the future and experience negative emotions as a result, you are making your subconscious live through that event, over and over. And every time this happens, you are imprinting that pattern deeper into your subconscious, thereby ensuring that it is destined to repeat itself. Now you can more easily see why the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Now perhaps you can more easily grasp why most people statistically do no better in life than their parents. It is all because of their subconscious programming. Nobody has perfect parents or a perfect upbringing, and the assumptions which were planted like seeds in your mind as a child yield fruit in adulthood. 
people become trapped in a feedback loop where their past negative circumstances lead them to presume they will have negative circumstances in the future, and their constant mental revisitation of these astral points in space-time are entrenching the pattern deeper and deeper into their psyche, thus ensuring the manifestation of similar results. What is in the well comes up in the bucket. This is why what you think of you, your identity, your persona, and your place in the world is everything. To change the world, you need only change yourself. To return, if I may, to another biblical analogy, Jesus Christ had good reason for telling people that they would receive according to their faith. According to thy faith, be it unto you. What you presume about yourself dictates the results you get in life, and what you imagine again and again about yourself is what dictates what you think about yourself. The simple adage, believe in yourself, may sound ridiculous when put so simply, and yet it is one of the best statements ever made. But what is someone to do when they do not believe in themselves? What if their addiction to imagining themselves in these negative circumstances is preventing them from adequately visualizing themselves in any good situation? After all, the pinnacle of evolution is the conscious mind, and the conscious mind learns by trial and error. If all I've had is negative results, why am I to assume that I will achieve positive results in the future? What if I visualize positive results and they don't come? I will be left feeling more hopeless than I did before. If I can visualize good things for myself and feel the emotions associated, then I can install a new program, a new blueprint for my subconscious to chew on and ultimately bring to fruition. But what am I to do if I am so caught up in my current negative situation, in the so-called real world, that I cannot seem to find the willpower to sit for long periods and visualize anything better? After all, that time could be better spent actually attempting to change my circumstances, right? This is where magic comes in. The conscious mind is noisy to the point of annoyance. The moment that you think or imagine something good for yourself, it will quickly tell you every reason why you can't and won't have that happen for you. Such incredible things happen to others every day. Why not you? Still, the conscious mind is a hard governor, and being that it is the seat of the ego, it desperately wants to avoid pain, physical, emotional, or otherwise. It is a survival function of the ego to dismantle ideas which it deems to be fantastical. It does so not to work against you, but because it perceives it is working with you by sparing you the pain of trying and failing. This response falls under the category of what we call the critical faculty of the mind. This is why the negative voice in your head is often referred to as your inner critic. The goal of magic, simply put, is to shroud positive messages in symbolism, to abstract a new blueprint of positive messaging in symbols which the conscious mind does not recognize as being anything but a symbol, but the subconscious understands to be much more. The goal is to completely bypass the conscious mind's critical faculty and present the subconscious with a new set of empowering programs while the conscious mind is none the wiser and therefore unable to criticize. Magic is akin to sneaking into the mind through the back door, hacking it, and sneaking back out like Mission Impossible. Rather than directly visualizing yourself in the situation you want, as those of the Law of Attraction community would advise, Magic is to provide a system of symbols which have meanings and emotions attached which you can present to the subconscious to make that same change without all the inner dialogue. These symbols become a language of their own, and it is a language which your conscious mind does not necessarily speak. Therefore, your intention gets the final say and your inner critic has no choice but to sit down and shut up. With all this said, you should now have a decent understanding of all of the skills you will need to perform magic, as well as a solid foundation for its performance. In just a few short chapters, you will be ready to perform your first ritual. In the next chapters, I will explain the symbols we will be using and their correspondences. It is important for you to keep an open mind in the coming portion, as I will be forced to use a great deal of religious and mythological imagery, as well as spiritual jargon but I assure you, it will all come together to be quite scientific. This concludes Chapter 5. Chapter 6. Maps of Correspondence Unless it is your particular cup of tea, you are under no obligation to take any of the symbolism discussed in this chapter literally. 
I am only providing you with this information because it will be necessary that you understand the relationship between certain symbols in order to understand some of the references I will be making in coming chapters, as well as to be able to perform the traditional magic of the Golden Dawn. Our goal is to create an entire interconnected set of symbols and correspondences for ritual performance, particularly the LBRP. To keep things brief, from this point forward, I will be referring to the lesser banishing and lesser invoking rituals of the pentagram as the LBRP and the LIRP, respectively. Think of these symbols, names, words, colors, etc. as a language for the subconscious, and the performance of a ritual as the act of communicating with the mind in this language. So without further ado, let's go over some of the symbolism you should be familiar with. Chakras Firstly, we should go over the chakra system. Now, I am not here to confirm or deny the existence of such a thing. I am just here to familiarize you with it as a concept. You will later see why this is relevant. If you find the topic of chakras interesting, I encourage you to research them as it is a fascinating topic if nothing else, and there are many meditations based around energizing or clearing these chakras. Who knows? Perhaps you manage to somehow put yourself in better mental or physical health and find yourself convinced of their existence. There are many different understandings of the chakras, and the number that are purported to exist in the human body vary widely between cultures and traditions. Buddhist understandings tend to simplify the concept, while certain Indian traditions consider the existence of hundreds or even thousands of them. Most commonly, however, you will hear of them referred to as being seven in number, ranging from the top of the head to the reproductive organs. What is a chakra? A chakra is allegedly a circular sort of vortex of energy which exists at some key point in the human body. It is not seen, but it has some predetermined function regarding the regulation of certain processes, as well as effects on the spiritual plane. Whether or not this is factual is not of our concern, as we can all but guarantee that they have a psychological function, if nothing else. The seven chakras have seven different locations and functions in the body, as well as seven associated colors. I will give a brief explanation of each of the chakras now. The lowest chakra is called the root chakra. Its color is red, and it exists at the base of the spine and in the same region as your genitals. Shockingly, this chakra only functions secondarily as a repository for sexual energy. Its primary role is to ground you, to give you the sensation of being connected to your environment and one with the earth, mentally, spiritually, and especially physically. It does, however, rule over the process of reproduction. Above the root chakra, and just beneath the navel, is the sacral chakra. The color commonly associated with it is orange, and it is this chakra that you can uplift or blame, depending upon how you look at it, for your sexual desires. It is associated with the expression of emotion, and it rules over your lymphatic system. Above the navel, and just beneath the ribcage, is the solar plexus chakra. Its color is yellow, and it is associated with your level of discipline, self-esteem, and confidence. It is also said to be what is responsible for your getting a gut feeling or a general intuition about something. In the center of the chest resides the heart chakra, whose color is green. It is obviously closely associated with the process of the physical organ of the same name, and it is said to be where you feel love and compassion. It is also connected to your sense of emotional and mental well-being. The throat chakra is presumed to be located well, in the throat or thereabout. Its color is blue, and it is associated with speech and creativity. It is connected to your ability to openly express your opinion, communicate, and create by the usage of language. In the center of your forehead and just between the eyes lies the third eye chakra. The color associated with this chakra is purple, and it is associated with thought on the material plane, and psychic ability or astral travel on the spiritual or metaphysical plane. Lastly, we have the crown chakra, which is located at the top of the skull, and generally depicted as being either light pink or white in color. This chakra is seen as your direct connection to God, the Source, the Universe, etc. It is responsible for consciousness itself, and it is associated with the Buddhist idea of nirvana. You may notice that the chakras are the colors of the rainbow. 
This is directly relevant to the concept of the rainbow body or the body of light that is sometimes spoken of in spiritual circles. A random fact, but worth noting. Next, I will give a brief explanation of the Tree of Life from the study of Kabbalah. You will likely begin to notice certain commonalities. Kabbalah and the Tree of Life We will not be going into too much of the study of Kabbalah, as it would be extraordinarily time-consuming and unnecessary for our purposes. But I want you to have a general understanding of the diagram known as the Tree of Life, which has become a staple in Kabbalistic teachings. Kabbalah is a school of esoteric thought which originated as a Hebrew tradition, came to extend into Christian tradition, and upon the adoption of the diagram known as the Tree of Life, has now become a common central theme in many, if not all, mystical teachings. The diagram commonly depicts ten spheres which are connected by twenty-two paths. Sound familiar? You see why I drew the parallel to Jung's archetypes earlier now. It is often shown with a lightning bolt descending the chart in a zigzag. The diagram can be seen as a depiction of a great many things, none of which can be called wrong. Indeed, it is even considered by some to be an all-encompassing explanation of reality itself on all planes. The diagram is seen as a representation of the very process by which reality came into being. The lightning bolt, which descends the tree, can be seen as the spark of divinity from the Creator, which raced through the nodes, resulting in our manifested world as God spoke, Let there be light or perhaps the Big Bang, whatever way you want to rationalize it. The Ten Spheres are called the Ten Sephiroth, shout out to my Final Fantasy fans out there, and they are referred to as Ten Emanations from God, or Ten Expressions of the Creator. These Ten Spheres are usually accepted to be Ten Archetypes, which came from the very mind of God, or, in our case, Ten Aspects of the Human Psyche. Connecting these Ten Sephiroth are 22 lines which are called Paths, these paths denote the movement between the ten nodes. They reveal in which way the ten nodes may connect and the interplay between each node. Each node has an associated color and number, as well as an associated name and celestial body. The spheres and any relevant associations are as follows. At the top, we have Keter. Keter has no gender association. It is represented by the color white and the number one. It is meant to represent the very first emanation of God, if not God itself. It is a singularity of vast and infinite light, and it is this primordial energy out of which all things come and all things return to. Its associated celestial body is Pluto. Beneath Keter, and to its right, we have Chokma, which means wisdom. It is number two, and its color is usually a light gray. Chokma is considered masculine, and it is the moment at which the divine light of Keter propels forth with rapid intensity through time and space towards manifestation with fiery heat. It is seen as a kind of primordial fatherly energy, and its associated celestial body is Neptune. To the immediate left of Chokma comes Baina, which means understanding. It is number three and considered to be feminine. Baina is thought of as a motherly energy which receives the direct input of fiery energy from Chokma and begins the process of cooling and nourishing it so that it may be transmuted into many different forms of physical manifestation. Baina is considered to be the beginning of time itself, and its associated celestial body is Saturn. These upper three Sephiroth are called the supernal or primordial energies and they exist above an imaginary line of demarcation known as the abyss upon the diagram. This is because nothing of physical substance exists above this line of demarcation. A good way of imagining these energies is as a man pouring water into a pot. The water is the energy responsible for creation, and Keter is the man pouring the water. Keter pours out this water, or energy. As the water is poured out by Keter, it is put into a kinetic state of chokma, as it is now in transit towards a goal, but it is formless and unbound. Baina is the pot which the water in the state of chokma is poured into. Baina is the origin of time, and since our space-time continuum would not exist without time, Baina, like the pot, acts as a containment vessel for the energy. Beneath these three spheres is when Baina metaphorically births creation. From this point onward, things begin to manifest in physical form, and they do so in increasing levels of density until they reach the final sphere at the bottom. 
More on this in a moment. From here on, I will be less specific with regard to the function of each sphere, with exception to the final two, as there are so many viable interpretations of these next few sephiroth that we could be here for some time discussing the nuances. Next, we have Kesed, meaning kindness, and it is number four. It is beneath Chokma and diagonal from Baina. It is commonly colored blue, and it is associated with the planet Jupiter. Directly across from Kesed, to the left, is Gebura, meaning severity. It is number five and generally red in color. It is associated with the planet Mars as such. Centered beneath both Kesed and Gebura is a central node which is called Tiferet, which means beauty. Its number is six, and it is generally shown as yellow, as its associated celestial body is the sun. Directly beneath Kesed and diagonal from Gebura, we find Netzak, which means victory. Its number is seven, and it is usually represented with the color green. It stands to reason, then, that its associated celestial body is the planet Venus, the green dragon or the morning star. Straight across from Netzak is Hod, which means splendor. Its number is eight in sequence, and its color is orange. Hod is represented by the planet Mercury. Centered beneath both Netzak and Hod, in similar fashion to Tiferet, is Yesod. Yesod means foundation, and its number is nine. Yesod is most often depicted as purple, and its associated celestial body is the moon. Yesod is the final converging point and the last stop before the earthly plane. It is the moment of pause prior to the complete manifestation of a given thing into existence. Finally, directly beneath Yesod is Malkuth. Malkuth means kingdom, and its number is ten. The tenth sphere represents the material world, where everything has been made manifest in its densest form. It is often depicted as a combination of colors, as it is the culmination of all that came before it. Obviously, its associated celestial body is, you may have guessed, the Earth. All of the Sephiroth on the left side of the tree are, like Baina, considered to be feminine, while the right side are considered to be masculine energies like Chokma. Nodes which are centered are usually presumed to be genderless. The left side of the tree is often referred to as the path of severity, while the right side is referred to as the path of mercy. These two paths are often depicted as two pillars. The left pillar is usually black and the right pillar white. You may note that these twin pillars are commonly depicted in both Freemasonry and may be seen on the High Priestess Tarot card. In fact, as I've stated, each of the 22 major arcana cards are associated with a single path on the Tree of Life. Likewise, the two charges of the atom are commonly associated with each side, the pillar of mercy being positive, while the pillar of severity is negative. And if you ever hear someone referring to occult practices which follow either the left hand or the right hand path, you will note that they are referring to occult practices with an emphasis on the study of one of these two pillars. The three sephiroth which are in the center are called the middle pillar, and there is a ritual in the Golden Dawn tradition that I've chosen to omit called the Middle Pillar Ritual that is effectively a kind of chakra meditation, which uses the overlay of the Sephiroth of the Middle Pillar rather than visualization of the seven chakras. Do look it up if you want to give it a shot. Kabbalists believe, generally speaking, that everything came from Keter and worked its way through the process of manifestation until Malkut. They also believe that all things ultimately return through the grid back to Keter. Many Kabbalists consider the purpose and goal of spiritual attainment to be to complete this process of returning through the spheres while one is yet alive. The aim is to elevate one's consciousness back through the tree to be reunited with Keter prior to physical death. Now, I know that was a lot and not all of it is crucial, but the more you understand the terms I will be using in the future, the less like a madman I will sound. I saw fit to make you as informed as possible because it is good for you to understand these diagrams of correspondence, as the associations you make here can assist you in many adjacent magical endeavors. I would think it wise for you to study up on both the chakras as well as the tree of life on your own, just to better familiarize yourself with the concepts. The study of the zodiac is also of great assistance, but not altogether necessary. It does not take a genius to begin to notice similarities in these charts, and the more that you study the Tree of Life, the more you will see that its usefulness cannot be understated. 
The grid itself is a kind of formula that can be applied to entire branching systems of correspondence to create interconnected networks of associations. This is wonderful for our purposes, as it allows us to build powerful symbols backed by many associated meanings and concepts and graph them in a visual style. This means that the simple act of visualizing a symbol, or speaking a word, can call to mind a vast expanse of associated information with rapid effectiveness, and the less you have to think while performing a ritual, the better. In the next chapter, I will be explaining the symbolism that you would actually employ for a ritual, and how some of these symbols relate to these that I've just explained. This concludes Chapter 6. Chapter 7. Symbols of the Golden Dawn. The Elements. The most fundamental symbols which are relevant to the practice of any Golden Dawn ritual are the classical elements. There are four classical elements which represent both four physical phenomena as well as four conceptual meanings which correspond to these elements. These four elements are earth, water, air, and fire, as well as a fifth element of spirit, which is not expressed in the physical but the spiritual realm. Much like the symbols of the Tree of Life and the chakras, each of these elements is represented by a symbol, a color, and a set of corresponding concepts. We will go over the role each element plays in order from least to most dense below. These concepts will also assist you in other practices adjacent to magic and can be applied to both tarot and astrology. We will begin with spirit. Spirit is the least dense of the elements and as such, the origin of its existence is commonly understood as being higher on the tree of life and closer to Keter and the other primordial energies, as it is entirely non-physical in nature. It is represented by the color white, much like Keter or the crown chakra, indicating that it is the highest of the elements and its symbol is either a circle or a wheel separated by eight spokes like a pizza. It is pure consciousness and it is uncluttered by any of the other elements. It is also not technically considered to be one of the four classical elements. Next we have fire. Fire is represented by the color red, and its symbol is an upright triangle. Fire rules over the actual physical element of fire, as well as the concept of passions, will, and drive. Fire is seen as the driving force behind action, and is associated with the focusing of one's energies towards the attainment of a goal. It is more dense than spirit, but closer in nature to spirit than any of the other elements, as it is more primal. The next element, in order of increasing density, is air. Air is more dense than fire, but still not dense enough to take shape. Air represents the physical element of air, as well as the ability to logically reason. It is associated with thought, and the ability to debate or cast sound judgment based upon reason. It is represented by the color yellow, and its symbol is an upright triangle with a line through the center. Next, we have water. Water is represented by the color blue, and the symbol of an upside-down triangle. Water is the first element to take physical shape, and it represents both the physical element of water and the concept of the subconscious, the unseen, and especially emotion. It is responsible for the expression of emotions. Finally, represented by the color green and the symbol of an upside-down triangle with a line through the center horizontally, we have Earth. Earth is the densest of the elements, and it is said to contain each of the other elements in correct ratio. Much like spirit contains none of the other elements and represents Keter at the top of the Tree of Life, or the Crown Chakra, Earth can be seen as containing each of the other elements and corresponding to both the Root Chakra and the Sephiroth of Malkuth. This is sensible as Malkuth is the bottom of the Tree of Life and similarly associated with the planet Earth. It also is shown as containing several colors, which similarly indicates the presence and combination of the other elements. Earth relates to the actual element of Earth, as well as the physical world itself. Earth reigns over the domain of your physical body, its health, and its senses, as well as worldly possessions. You may note that the elements of fire and air each share an upright triangle, while the elements of earth and water share a downturned triangle. This is to say that the elements of fire and air are inherently masculine in energetic nature, while the elements of earth and water are feminine. 
This is because the elements of fire and air are seen as hot, unbound energies which can be directed willfully, while earth and water are containing energies which cool and restrict the flow of energy to a given area, allowing it to manifest on the physical plane. To give an analogy, consider the movement of atoms in the universe. Atoms which are loosely bouncing around have no physical shape or form as they have no restriction which is causing them to congregate in a given location to form a liquid or solid object. Air is all around you, and yet not bound, and therefore invisible. Similarly, fire wafts about as the atoms accelerate, but does not retain a single shape for long. It is constantly changing. A solid object, however, has an energetic makeup which restricts it to a given area. A solid object has a clearly defined edge or curve, denoting its separation from the world around it. Similarly, a liquid is boundless, sure, but it can be contained within a vessel, and it will adapt to take the shape of that vessel, whereas fire and air would simply dissipate through the nearest opening. Therefore, the masculine elements of fire and air can be seen as pointed, laser-like suppliers of energy, while the feminine elements of earth and water are seen as containers of energy, which receive energetic input and then restrict them to physical form. This association applies equally to men and women themselves in the process of reproduction. Not to be terribly graphic, but the man has a pointed genitalia responsible for releasing a directed beam of boundless energy. The female genitalia is aimed at reception as it receives the directed beam, cools and nurtures the energy and supplies it with a restricted framework in which to manifest. The ultimate result is a baby manifested from essentially nothing. If that isn't magic, I'm not sure what is. As such, the upright triangle is inherently phallic in nature and thus represents the masculine, while the downturned triangle is commonly associated with the chalice or the grail, as it is a receiver of what is to be given. Please do not assume all of this to be taken terribly literally. I do not mean to oversimplify the now rather complex concept of gender, only to help you to understand these ideas. The Pentagram Next, we will discuss the most commonly used symbol in all of magic, the pentagram. No, I am not referring to the upside-down star associated with Satan. I am referring to the very normal image of a star which you might have seen in a Walt Disney movie or anywhere in the modern day at this point. Pentagram essentially is a word to describe a shape which has five points and five lines connecting those points. If you've seen the symbol of a star, then you know all you need to know about how it looks. The pentagram is one of the earliest images used to represent divinity and later the shape of a man, as the image can be overlaid directly upon da Vinci's perfect man. As such, a common magical understanding of the star is a representation of the divinity within mankind. Each point on the pentagram represents one of the aforementioned elements. The top point represents spirit. The top right represents water. The top left, air. The bottom right is fire, and the bottom left represents earth. The placement of spirit at the top of the pentagram is to represent that the element of spirit rules over the other four classical elements, which is to say that spirit is more fundamental than the physical world. It is for this reason that the upside-down pentagram is closely associated with Satanism, as this is to imply the exact reverse, the physical world reigning over spirit. Now that's something you can tell your friends. Common sense would seem to dictate that air and fire go at the top two points as they are less dense, leaving water and earth at the bottom two being denser elements. The appearance of the pentagram, therefore, may seem disjointed and random to some. This is because the importance of the pentagram's elemental associations is not for the sake of displaying density, but the interplay between the elements. When drawing a pentagram, you will almost always begin at one point and draw from that point without lifting your pen until it has been connected to that same point. In Golden Dawn magic, the point from which you begin drawing a line and the next point you lead to alters which invoking or banishing pentagram is being made for each element. Do not worry, we will not be getting into the complexities of each of these pentagrams in this series. The reason, however, for their unusual placement is for convenience sake when drawing the pentagrams. The most common rituals are the lesser banishing and invoking rituals. For each of these rituals, you will begin drawing your pentagram by either connecting earth to spirit or vice versa. 
This explains the unusual nature of the layout, as most right-handed people tend to begin to draw a star from the bottom left and, moving upward to the top point, continue until the line connects back to the bottom left. This is the exact way to create the banishing pentagram for Earth, which is used in the LBRP. When performing the invoking ritual, the same process is done backwards. Beginning at the top point, the star is drawn to the bottom left point, continuing in this zigzag until completion. Now that you understand this, the names of these methods for drawing the pentagrams should come as no surprise. A pentagram which is drawn by first connecting the bottom left point to the top is known as a banishing earth pentagram, while a pentagram drawn by first connecting the top point to the lower left is known as an invoking earth pentagram. These will be the only two pentagrams relevant for the rituals you will learn here. Since earth contains each of the other elements, to draw the banishing pentagram in the LBRP is to banish unwanted elemental forces from your physical plane back through each of the elements to spirit. The invoking ritual is to call energy down from spirit through each of the other elements to be made manifest in the physical. The Magician's Tools Next, we will go over the common ritual tools for the performance. There are four tools, and these four tools correspond to each element. In addition to corresponding to each element, the tools also represent all functions which are associated with that element. It is not necessary for you to have an altar or any of these tools to begin performing magic, but it is good to get your hands on them eventually. Originally, members of the Golden Dawn would be expected to painstakingly make their own ritual tools by hand and then charge them as talismans. This is not entirely necessary in my eyes, however, in the modern era. You may just as well buy these tools online. If you can find any of these tools which are family heirlooms or otherwise significant to you, however, I would encourage you to use these as opposed to purchasing them. This helps create a powerful psychic and emotional link between yourself and your tools. The four tools are the dagger or sword, the cup, the wand or rod, and the pentacle, also called the coin. You may note that each of these tools are commonly depicted upon an altar next to the practitioner on the magician card in tarot. The sword can be used in place of the dagger, and the wand can be substituted for a rod or staff. It is not typical, however, to see solitary practitioners, magic enthusiasts who practice on their own and not with a lodge, opting for these substitutions, as the dagger and wand are smaller and more easily situated on a small altar. The dagger represents the element of air and, as I've previously mentioned, the associated function of conscious thought, logic, and the ability to reason or discern. It also represents all mental capabilities. The cup represents the element of water and the associated concept of emotional expression. It is also associated with your emotional health. The wand represents the element of fire and the associated function of directed energy towards a goal. It corresponds with the concepts of passion and will. The pentacle, which is usually a pentagram enclosed within a circle, represents the element of earth, as well as the physical world, the body, health, senses, possessions, and even finance, hence its other name, the coin. You, as the practitioner, represent the element of spirit, and just as spirit is situated at the top of the pentagram to denote its authority over matter, so does your presence in the ritual and ability to use these tools represent your authority over each of the elements. Each of these tools directly corresponds with its respective element, and the ownership of these tools is to, whether you perceive it to be literal or metaphorical, give you the divine right to command each of these forces within yourself and within your world. Take some time to familiarize yourself with each of the tools and their respective elements, these associations will be useful in understanding the implications of your actions in a given ritual, as well as assist you in understanding the function of the entities which will be invoked during these rituals. The Archangels A solid understanding of the elements and the magical tools will provide for a rather short and sweet explanation of the Archangels. Just as the magical tools correspond to their respective elements, the Archangels rule over these same elements, and these entities bear these same magical tools for the manipulation of their respective energy. Their names are Raphael, Gabriel, Michael, 
and Oriel, or Uriel. Raphael is the archangel that governs the element of air. As such, he is usually depicted and visualized as wearing a bright yellow robe and emitting a yellow aura. He is seen carrying with him a dagger or sword to represent his mastery over the element of air and thought. His invocation is denoted by a strong gust of wind. Gabriel, often pronounced Gabriel, is the archangel of water. He is shown and visualized in a blue robe and emitting a blue aura. He carries with him a chalice to symbolize his mastery over the element of water and emotions. His arrival is associated with the feeling of cool water around you, floating in a great body of water, or the feeling of the shifting sand beneath you as you stand on a shore with the waves crashing against your legs. Michael, also pronounced Mikael, governs the element of fire. He is depicted as wearing a red robe and emitting a red aura. He carries with him either the wand or the rod, his magical tool of choice, which represents his power over the element of fire and passion. His invocation is heralded by the feeling of strong heat, a spontaneous combustion of great flame, or a mighty whirlwind of fire about you. Auriel, also called Uriel, has power over the element of earth. As such, he is imagined to wear a green robe and emit a green aura. His magical instrument is the pentacle, representing his power over the element of earth and the physical world. His invocation brings the feeling of an earthquake tremor as the ground beneath you shakes and then settles to root you in place. Just as you will be visualizing the drawing of pentagrams, you will be visualizing these archangels during the portion of any ritual in which they are invoked. It would be wise for you to study what I have explained here as well as performing your own research to best understand these angels, their appearance, and their demeanor. In time, you will have your own visualized imagination of them, complete with their own personalities. The more alive they feel to you, the better. Words of Power No, I am not referring to Skyrim. Words of power are words or phrases spoken with intention and with feeling which appeal to the associated concept of God. They are most often used to seal a symbol or to charge it with the protection of the name or aspect spoken, and they are most often spoken in another language. Their primary function is to provide authority to emotion or symbol. To put it in less mystical terminology, the abstraction of a name or idea into another language which sounds magical appeals to the subconscious mind, as once its meaning is learned in your native language, the conscious mind can be bypassed more easily by speaking in another language. There are two sets of words of power, which are crucial to novice ritual magic. The words from what is called the Kabbalistic Cross, which is effectively the Lord's Prayer spoken in Aramaic and the names of God, which are spoken to seal the pentagrams. To start with, I will explain the words of the Kabbalistic Cross. The Kabbalistic Cross is a standalone ritual which is done prior to the LBRP and the LIRP, and in closing of those rituals also. It can be done just as well on its own, and since essentially any ritual you do is going to begin and end with one of these two rituals, the Kabbalistic Cross will be a mainstay in your practice. Learn the words well and commit their meanings to your memory. If you've ever heard the Lord's Prayer from the King James Bible, then you are familiar with what you will be saying in English at least, spoken in Aramaic. These words are as follows. Ata, which means unto thee. Malkut, which means the kingdom. Vigbura, which means the power. Vigdula, which means the glory. Leolam, which means forever and ever, and Amen. This is a closing which essentially means, so be it. These words are spoken in a powerful voice while the magician touches various parts of his body with either his two fingers or a dagger. The purpose of the Kabbalistic cross is to create an astral cross of light, which corresponds to various sephiroth on the tree of life, grounding the magician and connecting him or her with divinity. More on this in later chapters. Next, we have the names of God. These names are commonly associated with the God of the Hebrew and Christian traditions. This is not to assert the dominance of this God, as these words can be changed to anything which suits your needs, provided it is emotionally resonant. 
These names are spoken in a powerful and commanding voice during the drawing of the pentagrams and are used to seal them. They are as follows. yod He vav He. These are four characters of the Hebrew alphabet which make up the Tetragrammaton, or the ineffable name of God. Its pronunciation is said to be lost to the ages, and there are even superstitions surrounding the possibility of unlimited power being given to whoever can speak it properly. A common pronunciation used in the Golden Dawn, however, is Yahuwah. Adonai, which means master, and can even mean father. Ehie, which means I am that I am. This is God's alleged response to Moses when asked what his name was, and Agala, or A-G-L-A. -A. These four letters in English are actually an acronym for a full phrase, Ata, Gibor, Leolam, Adonai. This phrase means, Thou, O God, are mighty forever. These four words are spoken to seal the pentagrams at each of the four cardinal points in the circle, which encloses the magician during the rituals I will be explaining. I will go further into depth on this in the next chapter. Other Important Symbols There are two other symbols which are important for you to know in order to have a solid understanding of everything you will be doing during a ritual. These final two symbols should be easy enough to understand compared to everything you've just heard. The first is the symbol known as the Sun Cross, or the Solar Cross. It is so named because in ancient cultures it was a common symbol used for solar deities, or sun gods. The cross in general represents the union of divinity with humanity, so the encircled cross, known as the Solar Cross, is an extension of this concept. The Solar Cross is also the root symbol which inspired the Crusader Cross, which you may notice from tabards of the Knights Templar, or perhaps from the Umbrella logo from Resident Evil for fans of that series. The symbol, similar to the pentagram, represents the four classical elements as well as spirit. The two lines of the cross split the symbol into four quadrants. These four quadrants represent the four elements, and the converging point in the center represents spirit. Next, we have the six-rayed star. You will note that this symbol is commonly referred to as the Star of David, and it is the symbol which represents the Jewish faith. It has many meanings and can even be seen as a two-dimensional representation of a tetrahedron. For magical purposes, however, it is commonly associated with the Hermetic Maxim for the Law of Correspondence, as above, so below. This is shown by the two triangles which point in opposite directions and intersect in the center. It is also representative of the union of the masculine and feminine aspect, which, as we discussed earlier, are represented by the triangle and upside-down triangle, respectively. The symbol implies mastery. It represents the connection of the magician's body as a microcosm to the universe as the greater macrocosm. It represents the balancing of both the masculine and feminine principle, as well as their union. The Signs there are only two crucial pieces of symbolism left to cover. These are the signs. The signs are motions performed with the physical body, which have associated meaning, and each of these signs are used at some point during most neophyte rituals. I will list them in order of their appearance. The sign of the enterer. The sign of the enterer is made by stepping forward hard with your right foot and extending both arms out before you. This can be done a variety of ways, though it is generally done by extending both arms close together rapidly, at eye level. This sign indicates your focused energy being directed into a pentagram. Its function is to fill the pentagram with power, and as such, this sign is performed simultaneously with speaking the words of power for the names of God. The Sign of Silence the sign of silence is made by gently stepping with your right foot next to your left foot as you put the index finger of your right hand up in front of your lips, as if to hush someone. The left arm is generally left by your side. If the sign of the enterer is to project your energy forward and imbue the symbol with the name of God, then it can be seen as a masculine maneuver. The sign of silence counters this with a more reserved and feminine maneuver which is responsible for confining that projected energy to the area of the pentagram. Its function is to seal the pentagram. 
Final thoughts. Once you've drilled these correspondences, their associated symbolism, and their connections to one another into your subconscious mind, you will never need to consciously recall this information again for it to be available to you. So study it carefully and embed it deep within your subconscious through repetition. Take notes if you must, as writing assists with memory. Once you are fully aware of, and can recite by heart, the purpose of each element, symbol, and word of power, the purpose of each tool in relation to each element, the function of the archangels, and all of their associated symbols, colors, and names, you will be able to look at a symbol and it will trigger an influx of information from the mind regarding all necessary correspondences with little to no effort. Eventually, this process will become near automatic and require no conscious thought whatsoever. This concludes Chapter 7. Chapter 8. The Rituals In this chapter, we will, at last, go over the three main rituals we will be performing, how to do them, what they are intended for, their symbolic implications, and a few terms. I know that by now you must be itching to get into the actual process, but there are just a few things I would like to elaborate upon beforehand. Please bear with me. Suggestions for the Ritual Space The only suggestions I will be giving pertain to the setup of the ritual, how you should approach its performance, and some pointers and ideas regarding the setup of your altar and tools should you choose to implement them. Ultimately, you will have committed this practice to memory in such detail that you will be capable of performing this ritual anywhere without any materials or stimuli. In the beginning, however, it is very important that you learn these practices in a safe, private location. Find a place in your home, apartment, or even your room should you live with parents or guardians. If you find yourself unfortunately without a dwelling place at this time, Find a place as reasonably free from distraction as possible. Wherever you choose as your ritual space should be your dedicated location for a while. Your repeated performance of rituals in this location will build a psychic and emotional resonance with it and your subconscious will associate it with the working of magic. It is technically best to use a location where you are not going to be frequently aside for this purpose but it is of little consequence if your circumstances dictate otherwise. Keep this location clean and uncluttered. Cleanliness is next to godliness. The appearance of this location at the time of ritual will have a subconscious effect, so the tidier the better. A messy altar belongs to a messy magician. On that note, you may and preferably will choose to use an altar. An altar is, understandably, a specific piece of furniture, and as such, can be substituted with any flat tabletop-like surface which you can dedicate to this purpose. Some people choose to decorate their altar with a piece of fabric that is called an altar cloth. Generally, an altar cloth has colors or symbols which resonate emotionally or mentally with the practitioner. The ritual, as well as the ritual space, is all about how it makes you feel. Once you've set up your altar, should you choose to employ one, your next optional feature in order of importance should be the magical tools. Of course, any kitchen knife or hunting knife purchased from a gas station, as well as any plastic cup, coin, or twig will suffice. For best results, however, you should choose items which are significant to you in some way. A kitchen knife will do just fine, but what about an old dagger your grandfather handed down to you from World War II? or an unusual blade you purchased from a flea market which has some mystical quality about it and fond memories attached. A red solo cup will do in a pinch, but why not a crystal goblet passed down through generations or a ceramic cup you made with your own two hands in pottery class? You could just as soon buy a wand online, but if you actually take yourself out into the woods and try your hand at carving a branch into a wand on your own, it is sure to have greater sentiment, even if it is rudimentary. The founders of the Golden Dawn made neophytes go to great length to physically recreate their tools. This was done because the process was considered to be alchemical in nature. As the neophyte worked with the metals, wood, or glass to make these tools, they were also attuning their focus and sharpening their will. 
It also served to create an unbreakable bond between the magician and his or her tools, as he crafted them with his or her own hands. Needless to say, such an emotionally involved and focused task creates a powerful subconscious imprint. Your goal should be to choose tools which you either already have or intend to develop a relationship with over time. These tools should feel sacred to you, if not holy, and they should be treated with the utmost care. Once you have selected your tools, you may place them upon the altar in any manner you choose provided it is orderly and, above all, providing a sense of symmetry. Everything which goes onto the altar should be balanced, both left and right, as well as front to back. This gives the sense of absolute equilibrium and conveys as much to the subconscious. Lastly, some magicians choose to implement certain sensory cues. The purpose of these cues is to signify the beginning and end of a ritual. They act as a failsafe for the subconscious mind. As I've stated, the purpose of a ritual is to involve the subconscious in an almost theatrical spectacle. The symbols used in this performance imprint the subconscious mind with certain ideas. A magician does not want to stand before his altar explaining the process to another while considering what he wants to eat and wind up accidentally imprinting his subconscious mind with the insatiable urge for Burger King. This is a rather extreme example, but all levity aside, this is the sort of thing which sensory cues seek to avoid. Each cue must play to the theme, however. One must not incorporate seemingly random sounds or scents, it must be something specific which lets the subconscious mind know, without a doubt, that a ritual is to be performed. This is to ensure the subconscious stands fully alert at the time of the cue. Common implements are candles, bells, incense, or even magical garb. It is not at all uncommon to see a magician possess a robe which is exclusively worn at the time of ritual. This helps one get into character, so to speak. After all, when you are performing a ritual, you should perceive yourself as possessing great authority over nature, tantamount to Gandalf or perhaps Voldemort. Oftentimes you will see an altar which has three candles upon it. Generally, there is a candle which is white or yellow in color in the center, which is either taller than the others or perched atop a candlestick, and this candle is flanked by two other candles of differing color. This center candle usually represents the eternal soul and will of the magician, while the two candles on either side represent the left and right pillars of the tree of life. The magician will light first the center candle, and then use this candle to light the other two. This center candle corresponds to Keter on the Tree of Life and the Crown Chakra. The left candle represents the Pillar of Severity or Strength and the Sphere of Baina, while the right represents the Pillar of Mercy or Peace and the Sphere of Chokma. The magician will generally turn off all other lights in the room so the candlelight can add a mystical atmosphere to the ritual, and his lighting of these candles is both an effective cue and signifying both his authority over the two pillars and centeredness between them, his physical body representing the middle pillar. It is common to see incense used in magic. The incense you employ should be a specific scent which you have selected to use for ritual purposes only. Since smells are commonly associated with memory, the repetitive action of lighting and smelling this incense at the beginning of a ritual will act as an effective cue for the subconscious mind. Some magicians have a chosen song or songs which they accompany their rituals with. If you are the cinematic type, you will likely have a leg up on your peers in terms of ritual performance. As such, and as a composer myself, I can think of no better cue than a chosen soundtrack for your work. If it helps put you in the mood, then go for it. Lastly, there is the option of a bell. A bell is used to denote the beginning or ending of a ritual proper as well as to mark an auditory line of demarcation between sections of a ritual. Needless to say, this is an effective cue, but only when you don't go around ringing the bell for the fun of it all the time. Only use it for its intended purpose. Given that this bell is often considered to be for the purpose of summoning or banishing angelic or spiritual forces, I will gladly confide in you that I refer to mine as the beckoning bell, as I'm a bit of a nerd for From Software games. Any chosen combination of these items will serve to increase both the mood and the effectiveness of a ritual. They are, however, not necessary. 
It can be argued that each of these items are of vital importance from here to eternity. They are, however, little more than props as I see it. It is your ability to visualize, put yourself in the scene, and feel the emotions associated with that scene that is of greatest importance. If these tools assist you to that end, all the better. Terms There is only one term that you should be familiar with prior to my explanation of these rituals. This term is referred to as vibrating. Vibrating is used in reference to the way in which you speak the words of power. To vibrate is simply to speak in a voice of open throat, which seemingly vibrates within the chest cavity. The purpose of vibration is to associate a specific magical voice with these words, and it serves as a cue of its own. Correct vibration of a word should feel as if it is thundering forth from the very depths of your being, as if it is being spoken by God himself through your mouth. You should focus on finding a tone and octave which is accompanied by the feeling of the associated, well, vibration in your body. Once you have found this tone, which everyone does in time, use this voice exclusively to speak words of power, and do not use it otherwise. The Rituals For now, I will only be explaining how each of these rituals is to be performed during this chapter. Following this video, however, I will have another video giving a visual demonstration of the performance of each ritual. We will begin with the Kabbalistic Cross, which both opens and closes each of the other rituals you will learn. Its performance is as follows. The Kabbalistic Cross First, go into a meditative state and prepare to visualize. Following any associated cues you have selected to begin your ritual, you will stand either before your altar or facing a wall of your choice. Whether you have an altar or not, you should always face this direction at the start of the ritual. This direction shall represent the east. It does not need to be due east on a compass. Just decide upon the wall or use whichever direction that causes you to face the altar. Close your eyes and imagine your spirit, however you conceptualize it. Imagine that it is unbound by the laws of physics. Imagine it to be growing larger. You are growing inch by inch, and then foot by foot. You are growing increasingly large and beginning to tower over your home or the area in which you are performing the ritual. You are rapidly becoming massive. You grow larger until the neighborhood appears minuscule by comparison. Eventually, your head is far above the clouds. You may even see birds or planes passing. This continues until you are essentially side by side with the sun, and the earth is a small dot beneath you. At last, you are so large that the galaxy itself is beneath you. You stand, a giant, amid ever-expanding darkness in all directions. Slowly, you lower yourself atop the galaxy as if it were the floor. It supports you, and you feel rooted upon it with solid footing. About you, there is nothing, and beneath you is the Milky Way. As you bring your attention above you, you notice a large white sphere. This sphere is pulsating with brilliant white light, at once fiery and electrical. It glows brighter and brighter with every breath, as if reacting to your presence. This is the light of the divine. This is Keter. Physically, reach out your hand while imagining the same. With two fingers, your index and middle, pierce into the light and imagine a rapid influx of energy which surges into your entire body. Pull your fingers from the sphere and imagine that you bring down a single strand or beam of concentrated energy with you from it. It is warm and you sense great power coming from it. The light is not solid and yet not liquid either. It holds shape as you direct it. It is an almost taffy-like substance. If you've ever seen the movie The Matrix, imagine it to be something similar to the way it looks when Neo pulls his hand from the mirror and carries it with him onto his body, but without all of the associated fear. Now place your hand upon your forehead in the location of your third eye chakra and imagine that the beam follows your fingers to connect to that chakra through your skull. Feel the tingling of the energy passing through your head as your consciousness merges with the primordial mind of God. Vibrate, Atta. 
Feel energy surge again from the sphere into your skull and feel grateful for the willing participation of God in the process of your empowerment. From here, direct this concentrated beam of energy from your third eye chakra to your root chakra at your pelvis. Feel the energy launch through your body, blasting out through your pelvis and extending infinitely into the galaxy beneath you. Vibrate Malkut. Feel another surge of energy which stiffens your spine and causes you to stand perfectly upright as you stand in the midst of the tree of life, energy filling your body. Next, with your right hand, touch your right shoulder in correspondence with the Sephiroth of Chokma. Vibrate Vigbura. Imagine that the vertical beam of light sends out a surge of energy from the center of your chest horizontally to the right through your arm and extending eternally in that direction. Now, with either your right hand or your left hand, imagine that this converging point in the center of your chest sends out a wave of energy rushing through whichever arm you choose to use and touch also your left shoulder in correspondence with Baina. Vibrate Vigdula. And imagine this point in the center of your chest blasting out another beam of energy horizontally through your left arm into infinity. Clasp your hands together at your chest as if you are praying, and vibrate, Leolam. Imagine a sphere of light which is identical to the one above you, forming at the converging point of these two beams in your chest. Feel another surge of energy as the beam moves from an etheric state to an absolutely concrete state, rooting you in place and filling you with energy. Finally, vibrate, Amen while opening your arms into the shape of a cross, putting your body into the shape of a T and feeling the energy blasting forth in all four directions, both vertically and horizontally. This concludes the Kabbalistic Cross. This ritual is meant to connect you with the Divine and to draw its influence into your very body. It places you at the center of your universe and establishes your authority over your world. It is good to hold this T-pose for a moment and feel the energy surging through your body. This ritual can be done as a standalone ritual and is especially useful either first thing in the morning or just before you go to bed. It is also the opening portion of the LBRP, the LIRP, and the analysis of the keyword rituals, as well as many others. Next, we will go into the process of the LBRP. If you found the Kabbalistic Cross to be simple enough, then this should not be terribly difficult for you either. The Lesser Banishing Ritual To begin the LBRP, you will first perform the Kabbalistic Cross verbatim. Once this is done, you will continue through two phases which are referred to as the drawing of the pentagrams and the invocation of the archangels. You will close this ritual by performing the Kabbalistic Cross a second time. After performing the Kabbalistic Cross, you will next draw the pentagrams. You will encircle yourself and draw a single pentagram per cardinal direction. I like to think of this circle as a barrier which keeps all outside energies other than your own away, and the pentagrams as portals which have been sealed by the Creator for the purpose of allowing select energies into or out of these portals. Begin by facing the location you have specified to be east, or facing your altar. Following the Kabbalistic Cross, you will imagine that the residual energy from the sphere of light is still present on the fingers of your right hand. You are still charged by this energy of the cross and rooted between the light of the divine and the kingdom of earth beneath you. Beginning at your left hip, draw a large astral version of the banishing pentagram of earth. Start by drawing from your left hip to a line which ends at the point just above your head. Continue by following the same path downward to your right until you meet your right hip. Next, connect this line to an imagined point opposite your left shoulder. Follow this line over to an imaginal point at your right shoulder and finally connect this point back to the starting point at your left hip. Imagine that with each point being connected, you are tracing a beam of blue or white energy until the pentagram is completed as a large pentagram of energy. Visualize the outline of the pentagram before you. Focus on it for a moment, and then perform the sign of the enterer. Simultaneously, upon forcing your arms forward, vibrate yod heh vav -Hey, 
or Yahuwah, and imagine the pentagram bursting into brilliant fire. Next, perform the sign of silence and imagine the fire to congregate around the path of the beams to form a glowing pentagram of brilliant light. This pentagram is radiating heat and filled with energy. Using your two fingers, trace a line of ethereal energy with you as you turn clockwise to your immediate right. Consider this to be the southern wall. Once you have completed this turn, begin to draw the banishing pentagram of Earth again in the exact same way. Once it is completed, perform the sign of the Enterer and simultaneously vibrate the word Adonai. Perform the sign of silence, visualizing the same effects from before for each sign respectively. Next, trace an ethereal line of energy as you turn clockwise again to face the opposite direction from where you began. Consider this direction to be the west. Draw the banishing earth pentagram again and perform the sign of the enterer. Upon projecting your energy into the pentagram, this time vibrate the word Ehie. Perform the sign of silence as before to concentrate the now flaming pentagram's energy to the symbol itself again. Trace a line clockwise again to your right. Consider this to be the north. Trace the banishing pentagram of earth once more. This time, perform the sign of the Enterer and vibrate the word Agala. Imagine the pentagram engulfed in flames before performing the sign of silence once more, securing the energy within the pentagram. Finally, trace a line of energy from the pentagram in the north back to the pentagram in the east where you began. You should now imagine yourself to be surrounded by a circle of energy with four pentagrams radiating power about you in each of the four cardinal directions. Stand in the midst of the circle for a moment with the energy from the pentagrams about you and the energy of the cross within you to feel the weight of its power and protection. Next, you will perform the invocation of the archangels. At this point, you will visualize each of the four archangels coming before you to provide their assistance with regard to their mastery over their respective elements. First, you will put your arms and legs back into the position of a T-pose, like you were when you finished the Kabbalistic cross. You will begin by vibrating, Before me, Raphael. Imagine the Archangel Raphael appearing before you to the east. He is robed in yellow with a powerful yellow aura about him and carrying a dagger or sword, and his arrival is followed by a strong gust of wind as he rapidly unfurls his wings to reveal his figure. Next, you will vibrate, behind me, Gabriel. You will then imagine waves crashing against your legs and lower back, and perhaps the sound of a mighty horn. I like to imagine the brass from the movie Inception, but that is just me. You will then visualize the Archangel Gabriel appearing behind you to the west. He is wearing a blue robe and emitting a blue aura, and he holds in his hand a chalice. Next, you will vibrate, at my right hand, Mikael. At the same time, you will imagine a great storm of fire, if not pillars or tornadoes of fire, circling the area to your right. Then you will visualize the Archangel Michael appearing from the midst of the fire to the south. He is wearing a red robe and emitting a fiery red aura. In his hand, he brings a wand or a rod. Finally, you will vibrate, at my left hand, Auriel or Uriel. You will feel a great shock wave in the earth beneath you, which, after passing, leaves you feeling more aware of the earth beneath you, feeling rooted in place. From the north emerges Oriel, robed in green and emitting a green aura. He comes bearing the pentacle. At this point, you should be bisected by the cross of light and standing within a circle of light which is protected by a pentagram at each cardinal point. Behind each pentagram looms a massive archangel, each of which is holding a tool which corresponds to their respective element. You will now, with arms outstretched in the T-pose, say, For about me flame the pentagrams, and within me shines the six-rayed star. Alternatively, you may say, And within the column shines the six-rayed star. This is to denote you as the middle pillar. You will then imagine that at the point of convergence within the sphere in the center of your chest, the Star of David appears. 
Following this process, the invocation proper is complete. You will then repeat the steps of the Kabbalistic cross to close the ritual. I have taken extraordinarily few liberties with this interpretation, but I will not deny their existence. This is, however, the essential process of the LBRP. Its purpose is to ground you in a place of power over your subjective universe and to clear out all unwanted energies from your body, mind, and spirit, as well as the ritual space itself. Its subconscious effect is to rid you of all negative thoughts, emotions, desires, and ailments. Next, I will go over the LIRP. The LIRP contains relatively few changes from the LBRP, and the process will therefore require little revision. The Lesser Invoking Ritual The Lesser Invoking Ritual is practically the exact same process with the exception of a few minor changes. To begin, perform the Kabbalistic Cross as usual. Once the cross has been performed, you will perform the exact same process using the exact same words of power to charge the pentagrams. The only exception will be that you are drawing the invoking pentagram of Earth rather than the banishing pentagram. This pentagram calls spirit down to the physical world rather than dispelling materialized energies back to spirit. To draw the invoking pentagram, begin at a point just above your head. Draw a line of energy down to your left hip, Next, connect this line to a point in front of your right shoulder. Trace this line across to a point in front of your left shoulder. Trace this same line back down to the point before your right hip before finally bringing the line back up to connect with the point above your head. Aside from the difference in the direction in which the pentagrams are drawn, the entire process of the drawing of the pentagrams goes the same, complete with the sign of the enterer while vibrating the same words of power and the sign of silence prior to tracing the clockwise line to complete each portion of the circle. This is the only key difference in the ritual. Beyond this point, you will then close with the Kabbalistic cross as usual. The performance of this ritual goes the exact same as the lesser banishing ritual with the exception of the difference of direction that the pentagram is drawn in. Summary the purpose of the LIRP is essentially the same as the LBRP, but with an emphasis on drawing in positive or beneficial elemental energies as opposed to banishing negative ones. While the LBRP also contains the invocation of the Archangels, their presence is not utilized aside from overseeing the clearing out of negative or foreign elemental energies. The invocation ritual is primarily focused on directly invoking positive thoughts, emotions, passions, and physical qualities. Some choose to do both in equal measure, performing the invoking ritual at the beginning of each day and ending the day with the banishing ritual. I would encourage you to experiment with both and see which one is most effective for you in any given situation. Many perform the banishing ritual exclusively. I prefer to do primarily the banishing ritual and occasionally perform the invoking ritual as it feels more powerful to me. I do not want that empowered feeling to overstay its welcome and grow dull, however, as too much of a good thing can go wrong. As they say, absence makes the heart grow fonder. I therefore elect to use the invoking ritual when I want to signal to my subconscious mind that I really mean business, pulling out the big guns, so to speak. These two rituals are the foundation of all magic ritual. In fact, Many, if not all, rituals implement either a preliminary invocation or banishing, as well as one in closing. In much the same way that the Kabbalistic Cross is the beginning and ending of both the LBRP and the LIRP, either the LBRP or the LIRP are the opening and closing of any larger ritual. Think of the Kabbalistic Cross as the appetizer, and either the banishing or invocation as the main course, with another Kabbalistic Cross for dessert. In a larger ritual, either the LBRP or the LIRP, usually the LBRP, will be both the appetizer and the dessert, with a larger and even more complex ritual as its main course. Understanding these three rituals is the basis for all others. These rituals are intended for you to use to crystallize your aura by ridding you of all elemental energies which are not your own and imbuing you with a concentrated stream of purified elemental energy. To demystify this concept, 
the rituals are intended to rid you of all subconscious premises which you yourself did not put there, as well as any limiting subconscious beliefs that you may have allowed to slip past your conscious gatekeeper. They ground you in the truest sense of yourself, protect you from the insertion of unwanted subconscious concepts, and grant you mastery over your mind, which leads to mastery of a great many aspects of your life, empowering you to make changes as you see fit. These rituals should be performed often, if not daily, and I would advise you consider creating a regimen which works for you in which you commit to their regular usage. These rituals have caused magnificent changes in my life and the lives of countless others. Their powers cannot be overstated. Crowley once remarked, Those who regard this ritual as a mere device to invoke or banish spirits are unworthy to possess it. Properly understood, it is the medicine of metals and the stone of the wise. This concludes Chapter 8. All right, we are good to go. So this video is going to be a sort of visual demonstration of how to perform the three rituals that I listed in Chapter 8. So if you have not watched up until Chapter 8, uh, preferably all of the chapters up until chapter eight. But if you have not at least watched chapter seven and chapter eight, I would say don't watch this video yet because you'll have no context for it. And everything I'm doing will just look like nonsense absurdity. So, like I said, this is going to be to explain the uh, Kabbalistic cross, the lesser banishing ritual, and the lesser invoking ritual. I'm not going to go incredibly in depth into the invoking ritual because the process for that and the banishing ritual are effectively the exact same thing. The only difference being the direction in which the pentagrams are drawn. And I will go over that difference. I'll show you near the end how to draw the invoking ritual. I'm the invoking pentagram. Uh, but other than that, there's nothing that differs between those two rituals. So I'm basically going to spend most of my time covering the LBRP. So without further ado, here we go. Now, bear with me because I am sort of limited on space, so I'm going to have to do some kind of strategic maneuvering so that you can see everything in the shot. <clears throat> so the first thing that you're going to do uh, is you're going to stand in front of your altar. So let's say you are the altar. Uh, this is where I'd be standing, and I will assume that that is the eastern wall. You always want to assume whatever wall your altar is in front of, just assume that's the eastern wall. It makes things very easy. It doesn't have to be due east. You just assume that's east. Now, while you're standing here, and as another thing, I'm not going to do all the bells and whistles. Uh, I'm not going to light any incense or ring any bells or light any candles. I'm not going to actually vibrate the words of power. I'm just going to speak them because I don't want to signal to my subconscious mind to be uh, really paying attention and recording this. Which is kind of ironic, because this is the only time I've ever done this that it is actually being recorded. But, I digress. Point is, the first thing you're going to do is stand in front of your altar. The altar is your eastern wall. You are going to get centered and imagine yourself growing larger. You are growing bigger and bigger and bigger. You're going to imagine you're growing bigger than your house, then bigger than your city then bigger than your country, then uh, bigger than your continent. Finally, you are way bigger than the earth. Uh, you are still standing rooted on solid ground on the earth, but you are dramatically larger. Your head is way up above the clouds and out in space, and you can see sort of the planets surrounding you. Finally, you will imagine that you have grown so large that the, the solar system is past and the galaxy itself is beneath you. You are now above the galaxy, and that is beneath your feet. Uh, this is to signal to the subconscious mind, effectively, that you are centered in the universe and that you are now essentially the most important thing going on here, other than maybe the light of the divine and the archangels. So here, when you are in this situation, after you've imagined this, and at first it might take a little while for you to get that down to imagine that, but eventually it will become real snappy. You'll be able to imagine that very quickly. Once you're in this situation, there's nothing around you. Beneath you, you have the galaxy, Malkuth, the kingdom. That is at your feet. Around you, there is nothing but black abyss. 
You can imagine there's stars if you like, but I typically imagine there's absolutely nothing. Above me is the light of the divine. That's when you see this white sphere, this white celestial sort of ethereal orb, and it is radiating fiery electrical plasma-like heat, like a star. From here, this is to perform the Kabbalistic cross. You are then going to reach up and pierce into the star. And you're imagining that the moment that you do that, you feel its power just surge through your entire body. You feel immediately energized. Then you're going to pull down this energy, and you're going to imagine that a solid beam of energy comes from the sphere and follows with you, and you direct it with your fingertips. You're going to pull that beam down and touch your head and say, Ata. You will then touch the root chakra, Malkut. You will then say, Vigbura, followed, and, and to clarify, you can use your left hand, that's what I am going to do here. Some people prefer to only use their right hand as if they're performing the uh, Catholic sign of the cross, which I think is probably based upon the Kabbalistic cross. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Use whichever hand you want to use. I prefer to incorporate both of my hands, though. So, you then Vigbura, then you say Vigdula, you will say Leolam, you will clasp your hands at your chest, like this, like you're praying, and you'll come back out and say, Amen. Now with each of these movements, you are imagining a beam of light following the direction that you are sending it. So, Ata Malkuth, you are imagining a vertical beam blasts through your head, through your skull, goes down through your pelvis, and is out into the galaxy beneath you. After the Vigbura, Vigdula, you are imagining that these beams of light are coming out horizontally, blasting out from your chest, from where you ended the beam here. And let's, let's presume that the center, the center of the chest is Tiferet on the Tree of Life. This is where the beams are converging at. So, a horizontal beam shoots out this way, horizontal beam shoots out this way. When you cross your, your hands here in the middle and say Leolam, you are imagining a beam shoots either from behind or from in front of you, is blasting out in either direction this way. So you got a vertical beam coming down, horizontal beam this way, horizontal beam this way. At that point, you are done with the Kabbalistic cross. That's effectively the entire ritual. Uh, you are imagining that you are then in within this cross of light, which has uh, sort of inundated you. And you are trying to feel to the best of your ability the energy pouring through your system of this. Now, once you're done with the Kabbalistic Cross, you can then perform either the LBRP or the LIRP, which is the Lesser Banishing or the Lesser Invoking Ritual. The Kabbalistic Cross begins both of those rituals. So if you are going to perform the LBRP, you will perform all of the steps of the Kabbalistic Cross up until this point, verbatim. Then you have to do the drawing of the pentagrams followed by the invocation of the archangels. So to do the drawing of the pentagrams, you're still standing here, centered, facing east, facing the direction of the altar. You'll start down here at your left hip, imagining there's a sort of residual energy from what you just did, still on your fingertips. You are going to draw from your left hip up above your head, down to your right hip, up to your left shoulder, horizontal to your right shoulder, and then down again to your left hip. And when this connects, you have now drawn this ethereal pentagram in front of you. Now it's not sealed yet, but it has been drawn. From here, you're going to perform the sign of the enterer, which I'll show you the profile of that so you can see it. It's easier to understand from the side. The sign of the enterer is when you do this motion, you step forward and thrust your arms forward. You're going to do that motion into the center of the pentagram. And at the same time, simultaneously, you are going to vibrate yod Hey vav Hey, or you can say Yahuwah. Um, I choose Yahuwah, but either one essentially works. But that's the word of power you use for this direction. So you will first do the sign of the enterer and say Yahuwah, or yod heh vav -Hey. At that time, when you thrust forward, you are imagining that the pentagram bursts into brilliant flames. Either a white or a blue colored fire. And it's sort of unkempt. There's fire everywhere. 
you then step back and perform the sign of silence, which is like you're hushing somebody. Generally, they keep the, less, the left fist clenched as they do it. You perform the sign of silence. Now you are imagining that this fire sort of converges around the border of the pentagram and forms a solid pentagram of light. As if you had just got done taking something out of a, uh, a blacksmith, you know, and it, as soon as you pulled the sword out, the melted, I don't know the terminology to use here, but I think you understand what I mean. Uh, it's, it's red hot, and then it goes down to a cooled sort of shape. From there, now that it's no longer fire everywhere and it's converged, that pentagram has been sealed. From the moment it has been sealed, you then put your fingers back into the center, and you will trace an ethereal curve of line clockwise to your right. At this point, you are now facing what you should consider your south. Facing the south, you perform the exact same process. You draw the pentagram, the banishing earth pentagram. Then you perform the sign of the enterer. This time you will say Adonai. So you will step back, perform the sign of the enterer, and say Adonai. Imagining it bursting into flames, you will then step back and perform the sign of silence, and you will imagine that the flames converge around the border of the pentagram and form it into this solid pentagram of light, either white or blue. Recenter your fingers, trace a curve over to your right clockwise. I'm going to have to start talking from behind me now, so it may be kind of difficult to hear me, so bear with me. You trace this, this beam over to the right. This is to now be considered your west. Here in the west, you will perform the exact same process, banishing earth pentagram. Then you will perform the sign of the enterer, this time saying, Ehie. Ehie. It bursts into flames. You then step back, perform the sign of silence. The flames converge. Solid pentagram of light. You then recenter the fingers, trace the clockwise beam. Again, directly to your right. This is to be considered your north. In the north, same process. Banishing earth pentagram. Sign of the enterer. This time you say, Agala. Agala. Pentagram flames. Sign of silence. Pentagram fire converges into a solid pentagram of light. Finally, you trace the beam back to where you started and encircle it. At this point, <coughs> you are encircled, excuse me. At this point, you are encircled by this beam of energy, and you are flanked at all four cardinal directions by a pentagram of light, which has been sealed by one of the words of power. From here, you will perform the invocation of the archangels. All you do for that is put your arms back out into the T-pose. You will say, before me, Raphael. You will imagine the Archangel Raphael, yellow robe, yellow aura, carrying the dagger, all associated symbols, meanings, uh, correspondences. He appears before you. Raphael appears before you. Then you will say, behind me, Gabriel. You will imagine Gabriel doing the exact same thing. All associated correspondences, blue robe, carrying the chalice. Finally, you will say, at my right hand, Mikael, and at my left hand, Oriel. And you will imagine the same thing for those two archangels, respectively. Uh, he will appear here to the south with the element of fire, and Oriel will appear to the north with the element of earth. So you are now flanked on all directions by a pentagram and an archangel, and the archangels are of corresponding elements. Then you will say, for about me flame the pentagrams, and within me shines the six-rayed star. At that point, you will imagine that the six-rayed star, or the star of David, appears here in the center of your chest cavity, and you are still imagining at this point that you have the cross of light, the beams coming through you, pentagrams, archangels, all of it is completed as of the moment that you say, within me shines the six-rayed star. At that time, the lesser banishing ritual is complete. So the only difference between the lesser banishing ritual and the lesser invoking ritual is the direction in which you draw the pentagram. So if you were to perform the invoking ritual, you would do the exact same thing. You will perform the Kabbalistic cross, 
you will come to the drawing of the pentagrams. But at this point, instead of drawing the pentagram the way you did last time, from here up, from the left, bottom left to the top point, you will draw from top point down to the left hip, up to the right shoulder, horizontally over to the left shoulder, back down to the right hip, back up to the top. The only difference in this is to represent that in the banishing ritual, you are banishing from the point that represents earth to the point that represents spirit, thereby banishing all of these elemental energies back through the elements into spirit. Whereas in the invoking ritual, you are drawing from spirit down to earth. Therefore, you are drawing spirit, spiritual forces, through all of the elements to be made manifest in the physical plane. That's the only difference in the ritual. In either ritual, you will complete the ritual by performing the Kabbalistic cross again. So, to summarize, you've got the Kabbalistic cross, the lesser banishing ritual, which begins and ends with the Kabbalistic cross, and the lesser invoking ritual, which is the exact same, with the only exception of the different direction in which you draw the pentagram. So that ought to cover how you do those three rituals. Chapter 9. Practical Manifestation Techniques The last chapter wraps up what is by far the most complex portion of this series. Performing the LBRP and the LIRP on a regular basis will provide you with a great many benefits, both psychologically speaking and in relation to magic. The performance of the rituals puts you in a grounded and empowered state of mind, which will yield such psychological perks as greater confidence, increased visualization skill, and decreased anxiety in your everyday life, as well as a solid method of recentering yourself and increasing your mood. To put this in magical terms, you will become more conscious of your soul's purpose, or great work as it is called. You will begin to become more aware of and have more control over your astral body and its senses, and your aura will begin to crystallize. Last but not least, you will have established an open line of communication with the world of spirit. You now have a framework at your fingertips which you can base any ritual upon. Indeed, upon mastering the banishing and invoking rituals, I would encourage you to create other rituals using the same techniques learned from them. Once you are comfortable, you may feel free to use them as outlines for the creation of your very own rituals, complete with symbolism which most appeals to you, and for whatever purposes you should desire. Feel free to incorporate the magical tools into your rituals as you see fit. Just make sure you are using them for the manipulation of their corresponding elements. Just try not to use symbols that overlap or conflict with other symbolism that you will be using. Try to keep your rituals as non-conflicting as possible. A simple ritual, which is well thought out and contains meaningful symbolism, is often better than a more complex ritual where the same is not true. Less is more is a wonderful approach. The more it appeals to you on a personal level and the more it makes you feel, particularly the sensation of chills running down your spine to the point of goosebumps, the better. A common practice would be to open with either a banishing or invocation, followed by your own ritual, and ending with either another banishing or simply the Kabbalistic cross. Use your discretion and see what works for you. Be mindful of the symbols you use and ensure that your relationship with them is as positive and well understood as possible to ensure that you do not accidentally cause yourself any trouble. If you are a practicing Christian, for instance, I would not recommend implementing satanic imagery or sigils associated with demonic forces into your rituals unless you are absolutely sure of it beforehand as this sends a very self-defeating message to the subconscious. Likewise, if you happen to be a Muslim or a member of some other religion, and even the usage of the archangels or Hebrew names is at odds with your beliefs, feel free to change the names used and entities invoked to ones that are appealing to you. Magic itself is sacred. The process, however, is completely yours to personalize. Now we will go over a few far simpler magical modalities. These practices are aimed not to develop you spiritually or psychologically, but for good old practical purposes. The techniques mentioned in this chapter are primarily for the simple and practical insertion of a desire into the subconscious mind to see it made manifest. You can't beat the performance of a well-written ritual, in my opinion. However, the two simplest and most effective methods I have found for practical magic 
are the plain and simple concentrated visualization of a goal and the creation of sigils. Sigil work is more involved and more magical in nature than the former, but in my opinion, it is good to perform them both in conjunction with one another, beginning with the visualization of a goal and following by the creation and charging of a sigil. We will go over each of these, beginning with the visualization of a goal. Living in the end. I refer to the process of visualizing your goal as living in the end in reference to a 20th century mystic and philosopher by the name of Neville Goddard. He gave lectures in which he taught a great many mystical concepts in language that could be more readily understood by the public of the time. As such, many of his ideas are now mainstays of New Age thought, albeit somewhat obscured in new and different terminology. If you have ever heard the teachings of Reverend Ike, Bob Proctor, or Esther, also known as Abraham Hicks, then you have heard the teachings of Neville Goddard. Indeed, the entire modern practice of the principle known as the Law of Attraction has some connection to his teachings, though its roots go back much further. The Law of Attraction, in proper magic, is a secondary law to the primary hermetic principle of the Law of Vibration. The Law of Vibration dictates that everything is in a constant state of vibration, a fact to which modern science can attest. The atoms of your body and everything around you are vibrating at a rapid pace. The assumption of the law of vibration is that any alteration in your mental or emotional state changes the rate of vibration in the very atoms of your body. The Hermeticists also believed that essentially any process which can transform one force, object, or state into another can likewise have its process reversed to yield the opposite. You can see the truth behind this law in electromagnetism, or the interplay between friction and heat. Electricity can, by way of the correct process, produce a magnetic field. Likewise, a magnetic field can be transformed through a similar and opposing process into electricity. The same is true for heat and friction. Any process which applies friction will produce heat, and in the same way, any process which applies heat is likely to produce friction. Therefore, one can be used to generate the other. The Hermeticists believed that every emotional state created a certain vibration, and this vibration resonates with all other like vibrations in much the same way that a tuning fork resonates automatically with another tuning fork which vibrates at the same pitch. Or, plucking a guitar string may cause the same string on another guitar nearby to vibrate provided they are tuned to the same key. This is why misery loves company, and why happy people tend to surround themselves with other happy people. Birds of a feather flock together. The combination of these two assumptions regarding natural law led them to believe that any emotional state would yield a correlated vibration, and that this vibration would necessarily resonate with all similar nearby vibrations. They believed that, in the same way that a joyful event will yield a joyful emotion, or an annoying event would yield frustration, a person could reverse this process by way of holding a given emotion, causing their body to vibrate at a certain rate thereby drawing to them an event which correlates to that emotional state's vibration. Therefore, similar to the same law which governs electromagnetism's conversion between electricity and magnetism, or the interplay between friction and heat, in the same way that a positive or negative event would cause a corresponding positive or negative emotional response. Holding a positive or negative emotional response will cause the body to vibrate at a rate which will draw to it a positive or negative corresponding event. Here you have the basic premise of the so-called Law of Attraction. The essential process is to visualize yourself already in the situation you would like to find yourself, to become completely enveloped by this scene, and to feel with the utmost intensity any emotions associated with the scene for a prolonged period, as if you were there right now. Goddard referred to this process as living in the end, and he recommended that you practice this while in a drowsy, dreamlike, or sleepy state. Essentially, what is being asked of you is that you either go into a meditative state and imagine your world as you would like to see it, or do the same either just before falling asleep or immediately upon waking. When you are asleep, the conscious mind is completely inactive, but being the portion of your mind responsible for your dreams, 
the subconscious is perfectly active and recording anything and everything it perceives. The same is true while in a state of deep meditation, though the restriction of the conscious mind is to a lesser extent. Therefore, visualization either during meditation or just before sleeping, before the conscious mind slips away, is a good way to ensure that the critical response is dulled, leaving your subconscious open to absorb the new program given to it. Since the conscious mind cannot tell the difference between the real and the imagined and does not understand the concept of time, it is unable to tell that you are not actually currently experiencing anything while you visualize with intensity while in such a state of dulled conscious input. This allows for you to create a projection of your desire into the mind which will, over time as you repeat this process, come to accept this imagination as if it were already an established fact. The result, in theory, and I would argue in fact, is your seemingly accidental achievement of the very goal by a process which could almost be called sleepwalking. Your conscious mind need not sort out how to acquire the goal. You will be on autopilot towards the attainment of your goal with little to no conscious effort in much the same way that your subconscious ensures that your heart continues to beat. This is not to say that your goal will require no effort on your part, far from it. It is, however, to say that your efforts will likely seem like no effort at all. They will, in almost all cases, feel incidental and natural, if not unrelated to the goal entirely. Goddard referred to this process as going across a bridge of incidents, and he argued that nobody has any capability of controlling how these incidents will occur, only that they will occur following the implantation of a new idea. To do this, either simply lay down until you feel yourself becoming faintly sleepy or meditate for some time. Do not allow yourself to drift off to sleep just yet. You must walk a fine line, keeping yourself awake but not alert. Try to get yourself to a place where you feel close to nodding off but not quite losing the ability to formulate thought. Once you have achieved this state, either through meditation or by coming close to sleep, begin to construct an image in your mind that would imply the fulfillment of a given goal. To give a simple example, if you wish to find a significant other, imagine them. How do they generally look and dress? What is their personality like? How do you feel holding their hand or seeing them smile? Imagine yourself already dating or married to this person. I would encourage you to do this with a constructed individual and not a living person as free will is difficult to alter. If you are dating, imagine going on a single date with them. If you are to be married, imagine the wedding itself or some time following the wedding. Imagine that you are laying in bed and watching television with them. Look down at your hands and see both of your wedding rings on your respective hands. Simply imagine a single scene or a few if you can formulate several. Incorporate as many of your astral body's senses as possible. Hear their voice, see their smile, feel their kiss, smell their perfume or cologne, etc. Construct this scene and live in it. Stay at this place until you don't want to open your eyes. Enjoy it and deeply feel the emotions that you would feel were it happening right in front of you right now. You can do this with any goal, of course. I only choose this one as it provides a very easy explanation of the entire process. Whatever your goal, construct a scene that would imply that you have already attained it. Do not think about wanting this thing to happen. Only consider that it has already happened and that you already have what you desire. Once you are finished, you may either end your meditation or allow yourself to drift off to sleep. It is good to perform this process frequently for a few weeks. I would recommend at least once a day for a month. Neville recommended that it be done only once. If you can get into character well enough and generate a strong enough emotional response, this will do just fine. The point is to make yourself believe it has occurred. I recommend a solid month as that seems to be a foolproof period of time to implant a new idea. After you have done it for a solid month, Consider yourself to have a receipt for your accomplished goal. And then, and this is the hard part, forget about it. Yes, I said, forget about it. A month of consistent visualization of the goal and feeling the associated emotions should almost certainly be enough to embed this idea into your subconscious mind. To continue to think about it, off and on throughout the entire day, is to involve the conscious mind in the process. Since we are attempting to bypass the conscious mind, this is at odds with our aim. 
Once you have achieved satisfactory results in the procedure many consecutive times, release your attachment to the goal. I know this is difficult to hear, but it is for the best. Whenever you think about the goal during the day from this point forward, divert your attention. Your noisy conscious mind will only serve to complicate matters by implying the impossibility of attaining your goal or asking, are we there yet, on repeat, from the back seat. Allow your subconscious to do its work and to the best of your ability, keep your thoughts on something else entirely. We do not get to dictate when something occurs, only that it shall occur. Do not let this discourage you. Large goals require larger changes to your world and as such they may take longer to manifest. They will occur, however, and they will occur quicker and with greater ease than they ever would or indeed could have otherwise. This is the fundamental basis for the entire magical act. This practice is so fundamental and requires such little equipment and prerequisite knowledge that it can be done almost anywhere at any time provided you have a place to sit and be at peace for a while. Now that you understand how to live in the end, I will explain how to take this seemingly mundane practice and increase its effectiveness tenfold even further beyond what I've just explained by incorporating a more ancient and mystical technique, the crafting of sigils. Sigils. Sigils are the primary magical tool of chaos magic. Chaos magic, however ridiculous that may sound to you, is, perhaps shockingly, an extremely dense and complex subject. It is, however, actually reasonably simple to practice. Chaos magic is a phrase coined by, and magical practice created by, a man named Peter J. Carroll, and elaborated upon in two of his books, named Liber Null and Psychonaut, An Introduction to Chaos Magic, and Cyber Magic, Advanced Ideas in Chaos Magic. Chaos magic gets its name by going under the assumption that the universe is fundamentally chaotic in nature, which somewhat conflicts with traditional magic's presumption of an ordered existence according to laws set in motion by a creator. Chaos magic differs in that its assumptions about how magic works tend to lean less towards a complex commandment of natural law through definite practices and principles, and more towards a free-for-all shootout of chance and probability. Chaos magic tends towards the idea that the universe does not operate by exact or absolute laws which strictly govern its existence, but by random chance and the levels of probability of a given event. The practice of chaos magic is therefore to increase the probability of a desired outcome occurring out of the midst of the universal chaos, rather than to attempt to command it to occur by law through ordered means. Other systems of magic require strict adherence to their worldview in order to cause changes in conformity with will. Chaos magic essentially uses the maxim, anything goes. Basically, whatever seems like it works for you, does work for you, and you are under no obligation to hold fast to any one method or understanding of magic. The one mainstay of chaos magic is the practice of creating sigils. A sigil is a visual abstraction of an idea for magical purposes. In the same way that in the context of the Golden Dawn, the pentagram is a visual abstraction of the concept of divinity within man, or the wand is an abstraction of the concept of the element of fire and the principle of passion, any idea, concept, desire, or entity may be abstracted into a symbol through the crafting of a sigil. It does not take much consideration to ascertain how useful this concept can be. For anyone who has played the PlayStation 4 game Bloodborne, you may find a reference for Carol's ideas of crafting sigils in the character of Runesmith Carol and his Carol runes, but I digress. So what is a sigil? How do you craft a sigil? What does it mean to charge a sigil? And what is their purpose? Well, the simple answer is yes. You can go about this basically however you choose, and the crafting of sigils is a somewhat artistic venture. You will be personalizing your sigils and charging them by methods of your choosing, and everyone has their own method. I will be giving you the most commonly practiced methods of creating and charging them, as well as explaining a personal ritual I created and regularly perform that incorporates them. What is a sigil? A sigil can be basically any artistic rendering of some symbol which encapsulates the concept associated with it. It can range from a few rudimentary lines to, in the instance of Grant Morrison, a notorious chaos magician, an entire comic book series. Most commonly, however, a sigil is a symbol which is easily identified by you, 
but not necessarily by anyone else. This is not to say that certain sigils are not immediately recognizable. Consider the McDonald's M, if you will. Now that I've mentioned that, you may be craving their fries. Is that not a work of magic? More often than not, however, sigils don't look like anything to the people who were not involved in their creation, as they are seemingly random images consisting of overlapping lines and curves. This is actually a good thing. The more nonsensical, mystical, and abstract the symbol, the better the effect. Some prefer their sigils to look very simple for easy recollection, neat and orderly, while others make what can just as easily be called a mess by the untrained onlooker. How you choose to draw a sigil is all a matter of personal and artistic preference. How do you create a sigil? What I am about to explain is by far the most common method for sigil creation, and for good reason. It is easy, practical, effective, and can be done in a pinch. Following this chapter, and in another video, I will give a visual demonstration of the process of creating a sigil. First, you will write down your intent or desire in all capital letters on a piece of paper in present tense and as if it is currently a fact. I like to perform the practice of meditating and visualizing my goal prior to drawing a sigil and will usually do so for a few weeks or more before I create one. I consider a sigil as a kind of receipt for my completed magical act. But this is all a matter of preference. Let's say your desire is to be in better health. Your written statement should read, I am healthy, or something similar. If you want to be rich, choose a specific amount of money which seems satisfactory to you and write it down similarly. Say something definite like, I am a millionaire. Keep it simple and try not to use any more than nine words or so at maximum. Next, you will cross out all of the vowels in this statement until you are left with only the consonants. You will then cross out all duplicates of consonants which occur more than once. You should be left with a small string of consonants which does not repeat. You will then begin to draw these letters, intersecting them, connecting them, turning them upside down, warping them, etc. to your personal taste. You may choose to mirror certain letters or have certain lines represent multiple letters at a time. For instance, you may have the letter T with another horizontal line on the bottom of it, which represents both the letter T and the letter H. The fewer lines, the better. I like to make sure mine are as symmetrical as possible, but again, this is a matter of preference. Just make sure that all of the letters are recognizable to you at the time they are drawn and connected into a single symbol. You will now encircle this symbol. Magically speaking, this is to seal its energy off from outside forces, as this is what the circle represents in most any magical endeavor. Generally speaking, it is just very aesthetically pleasing. You now have a completed sigil. Cut out the image itself and throw away the portion of paper that has your intention written on it. From here, your goal is to forget all about what you wrote down prior to making the sigil. This artistic endeavor, much like the practice of alchemy, has transferred all necessary meaning and information from your original intention into the abstracted symbol. You need not remember the intent, as your subconscious records everything you do. A good practice is to hide the sigil for a while. Hide it in a place that you know you will return to, but will not be tempted to peek at until you've forgotten your original intent. The more intently it is focused upon while being drawn, and then casually discarded until later, the better. The drawing portion should be involved, while forgetting it should be casual. Just go about your life for a week or two. To assist in forgetting your original intent, it is helpful to make several sigils at the same time using similar artistic methods for several intentions. The similarities between them will make it more difficult to discern their individual purposes, which will make things easier after a few weeks of having not seen them. A good way of utilizing this same concept is to make several sigils at a given time, all of which tend towards a greater theme. Say you have one large goal that you wish to see met, but in order for it to be attained, it is required that several smaller goals come to pass. You could make a sigil for each of these smaller goals, tending towards the theme of the greater goal. I have found this technique to be particularly useful. Once you have waited long enough to get the sigil back out and have had a hard time remembering what it is you are looking at, it is now time to charge it. Now charging it is going to be a rather controversial matter as there are many different methods, 
but there is one which is commonly noted that I will have little choice but to explain. Charging a sigil is to imbue it with magical power. In layman's terms, it is to embed the symbol and its associated intention into your subconscious mind. Charging is best done after you've forgotten the meaning of a sigil. This is because you want as little conscious criticism during the process as possible, and your conscious mind cannot criticize what it has no context for. There are many ways to charge a sigil. Essentially, anything which can remove from you your ability to think cognizantly will do the trick. Provided you've completely forgotten your intention, you may simply meditate and gaze into the sigil in a state of clear-headedness. This state is known as gnosis. I do not encourage this for minors, but as long as you are of age, you may even get good and drunk and stare into the sigil for some time. Even if you are in one of the legal states or countries, I would not necessarily encourage the usage of marijuana to charge a sigil, as it may, for some, increase the response of their critical faculty. If, however, you can obtain a strain that reliably dulls your conscious mind, feel free to use it provided you understand the legality of it in your area. Your aim should be to observe the sigil for a definite moment in time, during which your conscious mind is as inactive as possible. The less capable you are of rational thought at this time, the better. It is for this reason that what I am about to say may at once make sense and also come as a bit of a shock. I stated earlier in reference to Crowley's penchant for sex magic that I would not be going into such materials, and I stand by that. For this reason, I will keep this incredibly brief. The most common way to charge a sigil remains to stare intently at one until and during an orgasm, whether that be achieved by masturbation or by sex. I trust I need go no further into explaining why it works. Suffice it to say, there is precious little thinking going on at such a time. Regardless of how you charge the sigil, a common statement with regard to knowing when it has been charged is to wait until your vision is so still and focused so intently on the image that everything in your peripheral vision begins to go dark and the lines of the image may appear to glow. At this point, it is a common practice to close your eyes and visualize the image in great detail and picture it bursting into flames and then cooling to appear as a symbol made of solid light. This is very similar to the visualization you do when drawing the pentagrams in the LBRP, so you can easily apply this visualization technique to charging sigils. Once your sigil has been charged, however you have chosen to do it, what then? What do you do after you've created one and are confident that it has been charged and embedded into your subconscious? There is one more definite step, or two depending upon your preference. The next thing you should certainly do is keep it with you for a while. Carry it in your wallet or pocket and look at it often. Do not attempt to recall what it was for. Simply gaze into the image on a regular basis when you get a moment. This will continue messaging your subconscious mind with the intention. The purpose of sigils is effectively the same as visualization, but it is done through abstract symbols and therefore more effective at bypassing the conscious mind than the mere act of visualizing. Some people, myself included, like to perform a final step, which is to release the sigil. Releasing a sigil is simply to get rid of it by one method or another and allow it to do its work. You can toss it to the wind, tear it open, breaking the magical circular seal and releasing its energy, burn it, or even flush it down the toilet. Anything that happens to appeal to you symbolically is fair game. I tend to perform an entire ritual dedicated to this event, and I usually choose to burn my sigils. I will explain this ritual in detail for anyone who may wish to give it a try. My Ritual The lunar cycles are often associated with magic. Typically, a new moon represents a good time to perform rituals which set an intention, while a full moon supplies a good opportunity to perform rituals involving bringing those intentions to fruition. This is particularly noted in the practice of Wicca. Therefore, I like to begin on or around the time of a new moon. After having visualized a goal as if it were already attained every night for a period of usually two weeks to a month prior, I will go to my ritual space and first perform the LBRP. Before performing the final Kabbalistic cross and closing the ritual, but after having performed the invocation of the archangels, I will sit and create a sigil. I typically continue the process of visualizing my desire one last time as I create the sigil, and I do not stop until I am absolutely satisfied with the resulting image. Once I am certain that it appeals to me, 
I will perform the Kabbalistic cross, closing the ritual, and I will then hide the sigil for a period of at least a week. I will often make several at a time, though I generally charge and release them individually on dates according to the lunar cycles in subsequent weeks or months. Following a period of about a week, I will collect and charge the sigil. From there, I will keep it on my person, observing it frequently for another period of about two or more weeks. The ending of this time period generally coincides with or close to the night of a full moon. On the night of or generally near the full moon, I will perform a second ritual. I will first take a photo of the sigil to commemorate it. I then perform the LIRP, which I again complete until the ending of the invocation, stopping prior to the final Kabbalistic cross. At this time, I light a dedicated candle which indicates that a sigil is to be released. I then ceremonially burn the sigil in a dedicated glass bowl. I close by performing the Kabbalistic cross or, on occasion, the LBRP. The ritual has proven effective for me time and time again, and has become essentially the only ritual I perform, as it is the only one I have need of aside from my regular practice of the LBRP and LIRP. I performed the LBRP nearly every day for a period of about eight months, performing the LIRP about once a week on average as a substitute for the LBRP. I performed the LIRP less often, as it feels more powerful for me and I did not want to wear this sensation out. During this time, I had not yet finalized the ritual which I just explained, but I made sigils frequently and can definitively note that these two practices in conjunction to one another both changed me on what I would consider to be a fundamental level, as well as brought about the manifestation of certain goals which I have no doubt would have been nigh impossible for me otherwise. These two effects in tandem is what inspired me to formulate my own ritual, implementing a combination of principles from both the Golden Dawn and Chaos Magic, as well as Wicca. And the result is a ritual which is, for me, symbolically perfect and incredibly efficient. This is just an example of the kind of rituals you can create. I encourage anyone listening to experiment and find what works for them. This concludes Chapter 9. All right, so this is going to be a video demonstration of the process of making a sigil that I went over in chapter nine. So the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is get a piece of paper and get something to write with. And uh, from here, you're going to decide upon an intention, whatever it is that you want to see occur. And you're going to write out a statement of intent. You are going to want to phrase the statement of intent in the present tense uh, emphatically stated as if it is happening now. Uh, it is a current fact. And the reason for that is because the subconscious mind does not understand time and it perceives all events, uh, whether a memory or an imagination of the future or something that is occurring right now, it perceives all of those things to be occurring right now. So you'll want to write it out in present tense. And while you are writing it, you want to visualize a scene that implies the fulfillment of that intention. So let's go with something reasonably simple. Um, let's say I am healthy. So you would just say, in all caps, you can use lowercase if you want, but I don't think most people do. I generally just go with the term I am because it very obviously sends the message to the subconscious without any real leeway exactly what I mean. Uh, so I am healthy. While I'm writing this out, I want to be imagining myself in a state that would imply that I am healthy, whether I am visualizing uh, myself with the body type that is most appealing to me, or whether I am imagining myself feeling uh, what it would feel like to be absolutely rid of sickness and uh, having no chronic illness or, or etc. Um, or a combination of these two things. But anyway, during the process of writing this and during the process of drawing the sigil itself, you will want to be imagining uh, that. So once you've written this out, you're going to cross out all the vowels. So get rid of all of that. Generally, we'll leave Y, even though, you know, sometimes Y. <laughs> then once you've got all your vowels crossed out, you'll cross out any consonants which repeat. So it looks like we've only really got the one H that repeats here. So then you will write down the consonants that you are left with. 
And these will be what you are going to make your sigil from, this little string of letters right here. From there, you are going to make a little symbol by connecting these letters. Uh, you can flip them, reverse them. Uh, certain portions of each letter can double for portions of another letter. Um, you want it to be as symmetrical and as simple as you can possibly make it. So if it's too complex at first, give it another go and just keep reducing it down until it's nice and simple. Again, visualizing all the way through. So let's start with, uh, we'll start with the T. So first, we'll just draw a T. So there you got a T. And then you'll want to add maybe, uh, let's say an M. But first, I should point out, um, if I flip this upside down, you can see this T also doubles as an L. So I can cross out the L also. So we don't need the L or the T anymore. Let's add an M. So an easy way to do that would be to first, actually, before I, before I add the M, let's add Y. Pull up this. You've now got a Y. From there, it's very easy to add an M. So now we've covered Y and M. And then from there, you can very simply to add the H, just put a, we'll put it right here. Sort of make it like half the length, I like to do that. So there you have a nice little glyph, it's a nice little symbol, and it represents a meaning to you. And that meaning, uh, it's meaningless to anybody else, but to you, you know exactly what this means at the time of drawing it. From there, you will take uh, something like this is what I like to use. You can go ahead and draw a circle around it yourself if you are particularly good at that sort of thing, but I don't know anyone who is exactly great at just drawing a circle freehand, so I like to use one of these. I might be a little sloppy with this, you might want to be a little bit more artistic with it when you do it, but I'll draw your circle, and there you have it. There's your completed sigil. From there what you will do is you will rip this portion of the paper off, you will get rid of the statement of intent, and you will forget about it entirely. The only thing you will keep in mind and commit to memory is the sigil. Once this is gone, you'll cut out, you know, this little circle. You'll keep it on you. You'll charge it. You'll, you know, do the works with the sigil, however you want to go about it. And that is going to imprint your subconscious mind with this intention. And it is going to bypass your conscious mind entirely because it looks nonsensical, but it has a meaning carried with it. And because you've been visualizing the entire time, not only does it have a meaning carried with it, but it has an emotional resonance with it as well, because you've been feeling what you would feel were it a fact. Chapter 10. Conclusion. Well, there you have it. This is all of the information I can offer to get you started on the path of magic. Not to be cliche, but magic is a lifestyle. It is not something that you do once in a while, but something which is always occurring whether you are cognizant of it or not. The trick is to become aware of its existence and how it operates so that you can use it to your advantage. I hope this has helped you to understand what it is as well as how it is performed. My words, analogies, and explanations are certainly not the best, neither are they the most profound. For some, my explanations may be so basic and mundane that they find it repulsive. Others may find it too complex and therefore feel the same. I have no control over who will be drawn to and accepting of this information. But I can only hope that it will be those who, like myself, have found themselves wanting for such a guide and appreciate its existence. There are sure to be select few who hear this and are like-minded enough for it to resonate deeply with them and assist them on their way. To those select few who found this guide informative and helpful, I sincerely must thank you. If you have read or listened to me talk about this subject, a subject which I could expound upon for days, and enjoyed it, then you are the very reason that I wrote this guide, and your existence makes me proud to have put forth the effort. You should now have a solid foundation for your magical work, and it is my hope that you will use these techniques to become the best possible version of yourself and achieve those goals which you have put on the back burner and perhaps thought impossible. Until recently, I would have been incapable of delivering such a guide, and I give all credit for my capability to present it now to the usage of these very techniques. 
Go and find your great work. Perform it and accelerate it with the liberal usage of these techniques. Create your own system of magic if you feel so inclined. In the words of Aleister Crowley, The law is but this, do as thou wilt. On that note, I appreciate you sincerely, and this concludes my guide. As a final note, if you have heard this material on a platform which does not allow for a visual medium, and you therefore were not able to see the visual representations I included of how to perform the rituals and how to create sigils, then you can find all of this information for free on YouTube by searching for the name of this book or by searching for Zachary Farmer.